too, and I was 11, <laughs> so it's been a while. Is that something you thought you'd ever see again? 1992 was a good year. That was my second year of law school, so now that makes me feel really old. But I, I, I did think that I was <laughs> it, and I'm so glad that it's during this election. Um, this is such an important year, obviously, because of the opportunity we have to elect two senators and the opportunity to send our electoral vo votes for Joe Biden. But on top of that, as you know, we lost three icons in our state this year, Dr. C.T. Vivian, Dr. Joseph Lowry, and Congressman John Lewis. And so it's so fitting that in the spirit of all that they represented, that we saw this diverse coalition of folk across Georgia show up and vote, and it has made a difference, and I'm so proud of our state. It, it does have that deep sense of history, and certainly uh, the three uh, icons that you named, um, their legacy, I think, is in the minds of, of many voters. Um, certainly the passing of Congressman John Lewis was in the mind of many voters in Georgia. Uh, the Georgia Secretary of State said a recount is almost inevitable uh, due to the, the small lead that Biden now has. Do you anticipate any of that changing the outcome of the race ultimately? No, I don't. Um, we, we may see just a slight change, which is not uncommon when you have a recount. We even see recounts where sometimes the winners get more votes. So you can't assume that a recount will favor the person um, who's on the losing end. But I think that a recount will be important if that helps uh, people feel more confident about the integrity of this election and allows us to move on with this transition and to begin to heal as a nation. That's why we have elected Joe Biden president, and it is, uh, it's long overdue, and I, I am looking forward to his presidency and all that, the integrity that he will bring back to the White House. You mentioned uh, the late Congressman John Lewis. Uh, his uh, uh, district uh, includes Clayton County, where uh, Biden is now finally uh, being uh, put ahead in the vote count as a result of the count coming from Clayton County. He represented that county for more than 30 years. How do you think his legacy, uh, as you mentioned, influenced voters? You know, do you think that was in the back of their minds as they went uh, or mailed in their ballots? Sure, and, and the metro area was so important. John Lewis also represented parts of Fulton County and DeKalb County. Both, um, all three counties were are obviously very important in the outcome of this election. But you remember the parting words that Congressman Lewis left us in his essay, where he told us that our vote is our most powerful weapon. And if we don't exercise our right to vote, then we could lose it. And there were posters all over Atlanta reminding us of that. We saw the NBA players with it on their jerseys. And I know that it was in the hearts of people. And even when I saw people standing in these long lines for hours, there was such dignity and just such um, a resolve and confidence. And, and uh, there's so many words that I could use, but you could feel the energy, and I know that has everything to do with what John Lewis left with us. That almost gives me chills thinking about uh, voters standing there and just having the resolve to stay there until they were able to cast their ballots. You know, you don't want people to have to stand on lines, but the fact that they are willing to do so um, is so incredibly powerful, particularly when it comes to African Americans in this country. Um, you know, we're setting up for uh, a couple of runoffs. Uh, Georgia is still uh, very much a battleground state in in terms of the Senate seats as well, and it looks like we're we're set up for a runoff. Uh, the outcome of those two races could single-handedly determine uh, which party controls the chamber. How do you think Democrats will fare uh, in the runoff on January 5th? Well, I reminded people last week of my race for mayor just three years ago. Almost 100,000 votes cast, 832 votes in the runoff made the difference that allowed me to be mayor of Atlanta. So people have to recognize that it's not over. And our vote is even more important because obviously uh, Joe Biden and Senator or Vice President um, Kamala Harris, as it will be, will need the support of the Senate. So people in so many ways have to be educated, but they have to know that this election 
mean so much to this country. And I truly believe that people will be energized by the attention that's being given to Georgia. And I'm confident that they're going to show back up. But we can't take it for granted. We still got to put in the work. In terms of just the history that's happening in this moment, it's, it's so shocking to me in some ways that the fact that America is about to have maybe a vice president who is a woman. We've never had that. Uh, she's also a black and South Asian woman. We've never had a woman at all. So the fact that it's a woman of color, uh, you know, who could potentially be the vice president seems like a big deal. In your view, just reflect on what it means to you as a black woman, uh, you as somebody in a position of leadership to see Kamala Harris rise uh, potentially to become the first woman vice president of the United States of America. It gives me so much pride. And every conversation I had with Joe Biden, he talked about wanting his ticket and his administration to reflect the diversity of America and to represent who we are. And here we have an HBCU graduate, a, a woman, a, a very accomplished woman. Um, and it is, it's great to, for me to see it happen, but I'm also happy that my mother gets to see it and my daughter gets to see it because this is so much that so many generations have hoped for. And then it's a great example for our children on what's possible. So uh, 2020, we can say a lot about 2020, but there are, are many silver linings and, and this will be one of them. Mayor Keisha Lance Bottoms, thank you so much for being here. Coming up, I'll talk to Congresswoman Mary Gay Scanlon of the all important state of Pennsylvania. And as we go to break, votes are still being counted in the remaining battleground states, and it might be a few more days before we have a final count. We know everyone wants to know who won, but please be patient. So you said the 31,000 was the total for this morning. It won't be, or 30,000, it won't well, be. It's not 31,000. I'm sorry, 30, can you, so let's just be clear here. 30,403 was the increase. 30,403. This afternoon, before 4 p.m., how many do you expect? Because we're starting to dump two reports a day, I can't accurately give you that number. When it comes to Las Vegas, you can usually get what you want when you want it. But when it comes to this election, we all just have to be really patient. Let's take a look at the count in Nevada right now. Joe Biden is holding on to a slim lead, but NBC News still has the race too close to call. In Clark County, home to Las Vegas, they have more than 60,000 mail-in ballots to count, which they expect to finish by Sunday. The Trump campaign has been making baseless claims about voter fraud in Nevada. We're still waiting on any evidence to back it up. A lawsuit was expected, but nothing has been filed yet. Also out west, the tight race in Arizona, Biden still holds a slim lead there as well. But NBC says that race is also too close to call. Trump supporters have been outside the Maricopa County Elections Office the last few nights, ironically, demanding that all the votes be counted. And yes, that is Alex Jones leading the crowd maskless in Phoenix last night. Now, let's be clear. If Joe Biden wins the state of Pennsylvania, then he wouldn't need Nevada, Arizona, or Georgia to reach 270 electoral votes. But they would matter when it comes to making a statement and running up the score. 
Joining us now, political reporter for The Washington Post and host of the new podcast, The Next Four Years, Eugene Scott, Democratic strategist Aisha Mills, and White House reporter for Reuters, Jeff Mason. Jeff, I want to start with you. What are you hearing from inside uh, your White House bubble about the president's posture right now? We've heard a lot about, you know, his mood swings and how he's feeling. But as Joe Biden inches closer to 270, what's the state of mind of the president right now? Well, the, I can't speak to his state of mind, but I can speak to what uh, people around him are saying and what he's been doing, which is basically adopting a, a fighting posture. Uh, I think that he has shown with his statement today that he, with the, it was a written statement, that he wants to fight until all legal challenges have been exhausted, uh, and certainly until all of the votes have been counted. He, of course, would use the term legal votes. Uh, but in general, the, the sources I spoke to today just emphasize that they want these counts to be finished. Uh, so I think it's, it's, it's a fighting posture. But I would add to that uh, that there is also certainly a sense among many people around him that his chances are dwindling because they're able to look and see the numbers that we are looking at and that the Biden campaign is looking at and uh, have a realistic view that, that his options have narrowed. But uh, given the, even, even with that reality setting in, uh, he's not ready to concede. Hmm. That's, that's a lot. Wow. Eugene, for people watching at home right now wondering why we're not calling Joe Biden the president-elect, explain to the folks at home what we're waiting for. Well, we're waiting for the vote to continue. Uh, there was some confusion earlier this week about whether or not Arizona could be called for Biden or not. Uh, I believe Fox called it and had to walk it back. Uh, and so there's some certainty that people feel like, uh, you know, we should have, when I say people, I mean news organizations, um, to before actually calling all things. Um, there is also likely going to be a recount in the state of Georgia because it is so close. Um, and so there, there want, people want to be careful. Secretaries of states want to be careful. Campaign parties want to be careful on both sides uh, to not find themselves in a situation um, that, is, that resembles the 2000 election when uh, news organizations called the race for Al Gore and then had to walk it back. And it just created so much confusion and media distrust that um, it just left a stain on the whole process of declaring a winner. I remember that well. Aisha, take us uh, to 30,000 feet. Like, let's look big picture. We are witnessing history on so many different levels. Joe Biden earned more votes than any candidate ever to run for president. Kamala Harris on the cusp of becoming the first woman in the history of the United States to be vice president. Put this all into historical perspective for us. <laughs> You know, Zelina, I've really been struggling with this uh, all week because it is history in the making. Number one, we as Americans should just be proud of ourselves because of the record turnout in this election cycle. Now, some of us have been so exhausted by the decade of this administration that it has felt uh, a little bit more like a relief to get rid of Donald Trump than the celebration mm -hmm. that it should be. But the reality is that, for better or for worse, this Trump era has brought out and inspired people to engage in the process. And that's huge. So, you know, thank you for continuing to remind us that more Americans turned out for this election. And then certainly mm -hmm. the Democrats, Joe Biden, got more votes than anybody. Um, in the history of presidential elections um, received. So that's a, a very, very, very big deal. Here's the thing, though, and I'm not going to let this go, is that now that we are making history again, what will they do with it when they start to govern? That's going to be mm. the question. So how does our country change because of this moment in time? Absolutely. That's a really good point. Jeff, do you expect any ceremonial gestures? I feel like, you know, to the piece about how Republicans are going to respond to this in terms of governing uh, more pressingly and, and in the short term, we, we have to see what the president does if Joe Biden does cross the threshold and claim victory. If he does that, will there be a concession call between the two? What are your sources telling you in terms of what the president's plans are if, you know, everyone calls it Joe Biden is the winner uh, and Donald Trump has to concede, or will he? Yeah, it's a great question. I spoke to multiple sources today. One of them outlined it as follows. He made a, a comparison to the 2000 election, 
uh, when, of course, there was the long, drawn-out battle in Florida uh, between uh, George W. Bush and Al Gore. Uh, this source made the comparison by saying, you know, then-Governor Bush proceeded as if he had won, uh, started a transition team, you know, got himself ready for the White House, and basically waited uh, while Al Gore uh, waited to, until to the process was over at the Supreme Court and then and then conceded. The the sides and the hats are different in this one. It will be Democrat Joe Biden proceeding uh, with the transition and the current occupant of the Oval Office, uh, Donald Trump, President Trump, uh, waiting to exhaust all legal avenues. But eventually, um, if indeed the numbers get there and Vice President Biden becomes president-elect, uh, they say that President Trump will get there, too. Hmm. Hmm. Well, we'll see what happens. Uh, Eugene, if Joe Biden does come out on the on top in this election, what demographics would you credit uh, with giving him that potential win? Well, obviously, it's, it appears that uh, in these states that he won, um, uh, well, or that he's leading with, should I say, Georgia and Pennsylvania, um, the, it's the urban cores uh, are, are places that uh, turned out black voters, uh, black women and, and black men um, who voted in, in rates and percentages that uh, they did not vote in 2016. As you recall, there were about 4.4 million Obama voters from 2012 that did not vote in 2016, um, and about a third of them were black. And so uh, the, the Democratic Party was very focused on trying to get those people to return uh, to the polls. Uh, one thing I think is really important that people uh, may have glossed over uh, in all of the focus on uh, the turnout in the urban core in Georgia uh, for Biden is that Georgia is a state that a lot of Democrats, you know, don't try to compete that hard in because it's so red. Uh, but in the last few weeks, Biden would go to uh, Georgia, but he actually went to white rural areas, whereas his surrogates went, like, you know, Obama and Kamala went to uh, uh, to the urban core. And so he really wanted to hit as many demographics as he could. Julia, can I That makes a lot of that? sense. Eugene Scott, I... Well, we're... Yes, just real quickly, just one last minute. Real quick. I just want everybody to remember that no Democratic... Uh, president has won the majority of the white vote, like since in since Lyndon B. Johnson. Joe Biden is only mm -hmm. getting about 42 percent of the white vote. Barack Obama won the first time mm -hmm. with close to 45. So at the end of the day, black people saved America yet again, and I'm expecting this administration to acknowledge that. Well, we'll see what happens. Eugene Scott, Aisha Mills, Jeff Mason, thank you all for being here. All great points. Of course, all eyes remain on Pennsylvania tonight. And joining us now is Congresswoman Mary Gay Scanlon of Pennsylvania. Congresswoman, Pennsylvania is a scene of contrast right now. Dancing protesters in the streets in Philadelphia, which I love because they're in cosplay, wearing mailbox outfits, <laughs> which is really cute. Um, and, and they're saying we want all the votes to be counted and they want to you know, protect the results. But yesterday, two armed men from Virginia actually drove to Philadelphia um, and were arrested after police learned of a possible threat to the convention center in Philadelphia where that count is taking place. Are you concerned about violence if and when Joe Biden is officially declared the winner? I think when... Uh President-elect Biden is declared the winner. That our um, that the risk of violence goes down substantially. I mean, it, it has appeared for four years that um, a lot of the violence that's being encouraged now is because of the president's rhetoric. Um, I think we're going to be in a lot better place when we have a president who doesn't encourage that kind of of behavior. I think that's true. We definitely don't want a president that encourages uh, violent behavior in any way, shape or form. Today, uh, the mayor of Philadelphia uh, said to President Trump, uh, you need to put your big boy pants on. <laughs> and I literally did a spit take. Um, but I feel like, you know, his point was Donald Trump needs to accept the result if he does officially lose. And Pennsylvania Senator, uh, Republican Senator Pat Toomey said he does not see any evidence of widespread fraud in the state of Pennsylvania. Other Republican leaders in the country are sort of helping feed these conspiracy theories. Um, how should the Democratic Party, the elected Democrats, respond to these claims of voter fraud? Well, I mean, we've been responding to them for some time. The president's been 
beating this drum for the past six months or so, ever since he started to realize that he was not going to be able to win the election by fair means. Um, back in the summer, the Judiciary Committee, on which I sit, had uh, Bill Barr before us. And at that time, Barr had been repeating the president's completely unsubstantiated allegations that mail-in ballots, particularly in Pennsylvania, were somehow uh, likely to um, be subject to fraud. And he had to admit under oath in front of the Judiciary Committee, this is Bill Barr, he admitted there's no evidence of that. Uh, the president has no evidence of it. They have brought case after case claiming this. There is no evidence of it. Um, even the Heritage Society has a paper saying that, you know, they've, they've looked at all the evidence and there really isn't evidence of substantial voter fraud. This has been something that the president has been uh, pushing. It's a false narrative. It is fake news. And he's been pushing it for four years. And there's just nothing to it. All we can say is, you know, put up or shut up. And he has nothing. Yeah, put, put up the evidence or, or stop claiming that there's voter fraud. State judges are dismissing um, some of the claims the Trump campaign is bringing in court. They're trying to sue in a lot of different states. Do you expect any of these legal challenges to succeed? No, but that's been the story of Donald Trump's entire career. He brings a lot of suits. He threatens a lot of legal action, but he very, very rarely succeeds. He settles his cases. Um, he takes, you know, the slap on the wrist. He tries to bully and intimidate people. And we're just not having it, particularly in Pennsylvania. Yeah, I mean, you don't have I don't think we should uh, be having any of it uh, in terms of frivolous lawsuits. If you have valid ones, bring those. Um, but if you don't have evidence, I, I just think that it's a corruption of the process. It's an abuse of the process. Um, House Democrats had a heated discussion yesterday. I'm, I'm sure uh, you may have been on the call or heard about what happened. Uh, some moderates on the call uh, yesterday were blaming progressive Democrats, saying that maybe uh, claims of socialism, labels of socialism and defund the police hurt some of the more moderate uh, Democrats running. Do you, what do you make of that argument? Do you agree with that or, or not? Well, you know, we have a very broad caucus. There are a lot of different viewpoints. I think that the best thing we've seen is when people represent their own districts. I mean, that's always the uh, best course forward. Um, it does trouble me that in any way we buy into uh, the narrative that's being pushed by Trump and his allies. Um, you know, the, the Democratic Party is not a party of socialism. It is not a party that is seeking to defund the police. We're trying to do the best we can for the families and the kids and the communities that we represent. And, you know, I just don't want to buy into it. Um, I, I don't think we need any help to foster the divisions that this president has shown, that he is only too happy to, you know, drive wedges in there with the help of his Russian allies or whomever. Um, we just can't buy into it, and we just need to represent our constituents and, and move forward. We agree on the basic values. We agree that health care is a right. Um, you know, we may disagree on how to get there, but we agree that that's a right. We agree that we have to address climate change and move forward to protect the environment and rejoin the Paris Accord. Um, we may have differences about the exact way to get there, but I think the views are shared, and that's what we need to focus on. Mm -hmm. Congresswoman Mary Gay Scanlon, thank you so much for being here. If President Trump's rhetoric over the last few days is any indication, he won't be leaving the White House quietly. So what happens if he refuses to accept the results? I'm bringing in a panel of legal experts to discuss what we can expect over the next few months. I'm back in 90 seconds.
If you count the legal votes, I easily win. If you count the illegal votes, they can try to steal the election from us. I'm going to stand with President Trump. If a Democrat were doing this, it'd be cheered on. And we're not going to let the media intimidate us into exploring whether or not this, these contests were fairly had. I want you to hear this. I want you to really hear this. If Joe Biden wins this election, there's going to be some payback. Not violence. Half of this country will believe that they cheated us out of this election. The president and his allies continue to spread outright lies and misinformation about this election. Let me be clear. There are no illegal votes currently being counted. The votes that are being counted were filled out and mailed in legally. If Joe Biden has declared the president elect, it won't be because of found ballots. It will be because people voted for him. So as the walls close in on President Trump, what options does he have left? And what will happen if he refuses to leave the White House quietly? Joining me now is Melissa Murray. She's a professor at NYU Law School and Corey Brettsteiner. He's a professor of political science at Brown University and author of the book, The Oath and the Office. Corey, I want to start with you. How do you think the Biden campaign moves forward if Biden is eventually declared the president elect? I think they keep doing exactly what they're doing, which is to say that this is the rightfully elected president of the United States, and Donald Trump doesn't get to upend the Constitution, upend the rule of law. Uh, the Constitution sets a limit on his term, and when it's up, uh, Joe Biden takes over full stop. It's not a question of conceding. It's a question of what the law says. And I think reinforcing that point, that this is about the rule of law, sends a message that this lawless presidency has come to an end and it's going to be replaced by one that is about respect for the Constitution and respect for people's fundamental rights. I mean, they always like to cite the Constitution and say they're originalists on, on the Republican side of the aisle, so maybe they should go and review this portion. Melissa, both Larry Kudlow and Senator Mitch McConnell were asked today about a possible transfer of power, and they both said it would be peaceful. Listen to this. Of course, we've had a peaceful transfer of power going back to 1792 every four years. Uh, you've moved on to a new administration. In 1792, it was the second Washington administration. Well, I think there will be a peaceful transfer of power. This is a great country. This is the greatest democracy in the world, and we abide by the rule of law, and so will this president. Melissa, do you think they're right? Do you really think the president is going to give the kind of transfer of power he received from President Obama? I mean, Melania gave Michelle a Tiffany's box. Do you think, you think any of that is going to happen here? Well, I think those are two different questions. I think they're exactly right. There is going to be a peaceful transition of power. Whether the president goes willingly, I think, is a different matter. So I think you should note here that we are seeing rank-and-file Republicans, lifelong politicians, get on board with the Constitution. The people who are talking about resisting, wanting to go back and make sure the president wasn't cheated, these are his base. And they're stoking these continual fears that there's been some kind of chicanery with this election. The president was saying this even before ballots were cast, that if anything was mailed in, it would inevitably be fraudulent. So he's been laying a foundation for this kind of skepticism for a long time. But there is absolutely no proof that any of these ballots were not validly cast. Like, these elections have been going on. The people who are working in election administration are taking this incredibly seriously. And so the president can gnash his teeth and wail about it, but I'm not sure that it's actually going to get him what he seeks, which is the continued relevancy of being the president of the United States. I mean, I feel like he thinks he's in an episode of Scandal, which we are not in that. That is not real. That is not real. Um, at least I hope not. Corey, you tweeted that you don't see a serious legal threat, uh, you know, in, in all of these lawsuits uh, that the president and his team are filing um, in, in a variety of states. I mean, preventing a, a Biden victory or attempting to. What do you mean by, by, by that? 
I think the most serious legal issue might be in Pennsylvania, where there's a question about ballots received after um, uh, Election Day and whether they can be counted. But I listened to the Secretary of State from Pennsylvania, who said those ballots aren't going to make a difference, and in fact, she's separating them out. So that, to me, is the only serious legal issue. The court refused to intervene to overturn uh, the so far the Pennsylvania Supreme Court. We allowed the votes to continue, and otherwise, I'm seeing just a lot of nonsense. The president is making up lies about fraud that he has no basis for. He hasn't shown any evidence. And look at who they're sending out. It's people like Rudy Giuliani. It's it's really jokesters that we're used to, you know, making false claims. And they're backing up the president in his false claims. Thankfully, Fox News cut away from that speech because they, I think, realize that the jig is up here. And who would think that we would be praising Fox News? But ultimately, uh, they are coming through and reporting the facts. Uh, they have the numbers, the actual numbers on the board. And so I think these legal challenges aren't going anywhere and, and that Joe Biden is going to be the next president of the United States. I feel like part of it is a, a public relations strategy to say we're filing lawsuits over here. So it's like the Trump campaign is filing legal challenges. Melissa, do you think part of it is that it's a PR strategy more than a legal strategy? When you actually read these uh, filings, they're, they're pretty light on facts and law. Well, well, that is generous. Um, it's been said that if you don't have the law on your side, pound the facts. If you don't have the facts on your side, pound the law. And when you don't have either, I guess you just pound sand, which is what's happening right now. So I don't think that these are going to be particularly successful, but I do think that there is a PR strategy being lined up. I'm not sure that it's necessarily about this moment. The president is trying, I think, to lay a foundation among his base that he has been cheated out of something, and that lays a foundation for him for the next mm. four years to basically operate as a kind of president in exile for this large portion of the country that he says supports him, and they do mm. support him, but that doesn't mean he was validly elected. And so I think it is incredibly dangerous to continue this idea that he has been cheated somehow, that there is something fraudulent about this election, and we should all take it very seriously within the media and, and do our best to really debunk these notions, because we cannot have a shadow presidency alongside a validly elected president. Corey, in the last minute here, uh, I guess my question is, is there anything in the Constitution that helps us from having a president in exile? That sounds really alarming. <laughs> Well, I think there are a couple of things. One is the president has uh, claimed so far that he's immune from prosecution while he's in office. And there's a debate about that. But the Department of Justice does have a policy that says that sitting presidents can't be indicted. And I think that's a major reason why Mr. Mueller did not indict the president for obstruction of justice, despite the 10 instances of obstruction outlined in the report. But once he's gone, the Constitution is uh, basically a document of law. And there is certainly no immunity for presidents after they leave office. So I think that there's a good chance that these investigations by uh, Vance's office in Manhattan uh, by the New York Attorney General, Letitia James, and possibly by the future Attorney General looking into these charges of obstruction of justice, uh, that the president might be facing those criminal charges. And the idea that somebody who's really under indictment in possibly three areas uh, is going to be a leader of a movement in exile, I think uh, he's going to be revealed for the fraud that he is and for, frankly, the criminal that he is. And once people see the truth, they're not going to follow this faker anymore. Well, at the very least, I suppose that will keep him very busy. Um, so maybe he won't be able to cause much chaos uh, from exile. Melissa Murray and Corey Brett Center, thank you so much for being here. It was really helpful to unpack all of that with you. 19 former U.S. attorneys who, who served under Republican administrations penned a letter denouncing what they called the president's reckless voter fraud claims. They said they felt compelled to, quote, speak out against President Trump's premature, baseless and reckless comments about the vote in Pennsylvania and elsewhere. They also called on the president to patiently and respectfully allow the lawful vote counting process to continue in accordance with the applicable federal and state laws and to avoid any further comments or other actions which can serve only to undermine our democracy. Joining me now is one of those former U.S. attorneys who signed that letter, Greg Brower. He served during both the George W. Bush and Obama administrations, and he's now a partner at the law firm Brownstein, Hyatt, Farber and Shrek. Why did you sign this letter and what are the takeaways? 
Well, Zerlina, it's great to be with you. Well, I more than signed it. Uh, one of my uh, colleagues, Ken Weinstein, who served as the U.S. Attorney in the District of Columbia and later was President Bush's Homeland Security Advisor, and I decided that it was important to, uh, to get some support for a statement that really condemned the president's um, remarks the other night that, as we said in the statement, were, were off base and premature and really reckless uh, and had the tendency and, and will have the tendency if he continues to undermine the rule of law and the electoral process in, in, in our country. And so we, we gathered up as many of our former colleagues as we could on short notice to support us in the statement, and you saw the result. It's, uh, it's important, I think, for Republicans to speak out, Republicans who have experience with uh, federal law enforcement and, and who have worked for former Republican presidents, to speak out and really make sure that the American people understand that this is not a partisan issue, but what the president is doing is uh, awfully uh, dangerous uh, to our system of constitutional democracy and that uh, it just really needs to stop. He needs to let the process play out, let the votes be counted, and accept defeat if that is his ultimate fate. What are the real-world risks as you see them to what the president is doing and saying right now? Well, again, it, it tends to undermine our system of, of law in this country, our system of, of elective politics, our system of peaceful transitions. This is the way our system works. Presidents are elected. Uh, presidents have to run for re-election if they seek a second term, and it's up to the people to decide. And in our, in our history, throughout our history, more than 200 years of history, pres presidents have always understood that. They may not have always liked that when they have lost an election or an attempt at re-election, but they've always understood it and accepted it. And we appear to be on the verge, for the first time in our history, of an incumbent president refusing to accept that. Now, ultimately, I think he, he will be forced to accept it, and he will be removed, perhaps against his will. But for him to express um, the, the idea, based on nothing, on no evidence, that somehow that this is fraudulent and that there is cheating going on in various states, it's really unprecedented and dangerous for our system. Yeah, I feel like, you know, what's possible from this point on, it, it, it is a wide spectrum. So in terms of your point about him being escorted against his will, is there a system in place? Like, the law obviously makes Joe Biden the president at a certain time on January the 20th, um, and the law follows. Does that mean if the president refuses to leave, you know, his, his key card doesn't work and, you know, he's officially not the president, do they really come get him? Well, of course, there's no precedent for that. But I, I don't mean to suggest that the president, at the end of the day, you know, on January 20th, will actually physically refuse to leave the White House. I think what's going to happen over the next uh, few weeks, assuming that the, the results confirm that, uh, that, that Joe Biden and Kamala Harris have won this election, is that Increasingly, Republicans, including Republican members of Congress, those people who really matter to this process, will abandon the president, and and some will uh, actually go over to the White House and, and explain to him that, look, we may have supported you, but you lost. Uh, we see no evidence. We see no evidence of fraud, and so your time is up. You have to leave. And he won't like it. He probably won't acknowledge that it was fair. Uh, I would suggest that he may not even attend the inauguration of a President Biden, but he will mm. eventually uh, begrudgingly at least accept it to the point of leaving. Yeah, we do have some breaking news. So in the last minute here, I want to ask you about uh, this latest news. Supreme Court Justice Samuel Alito has issued an order tonight in a case in Pennsylvania. Uh, we've been following that all week. But it's not what the Republicans wanted. It repeats the guidance that all mail-in ballots received after Tuesday must be, must be segregated out, um, but it does not direct them to stop counting them. What's your reaction mm -hmm. to that? That seems to be, as I understand it, simply a confirmation of what the authorities in Pennsylvania indicated that they would do. And so I'm not sure it changes anything. I should add, Zerlina, that I just received word from my home state of Nevada, where the Trump campaign was in federal court today, that the judge in that case denied 
uh, the campaign's request for a preliminary injunction to uh, stop the voting or affect the vote counting uh, in, in Nevada. And so yet another a loss for the campaign. It, it seems that these, these various efforts at filing lawsuits are really based upon uh, no real evidence, and they're being dismissed left and right. Mm -hmm. Now, as a lawyer, I would concede that to the extent these suits are filed, they need to be adjudicated fairly. Uh, but at some point, when mm -hmm. suit after suit is thrown out by, by judges reviewing them, uh, that has to be a signal to the White House, to the president, to the people around him that, look, um, there's really no path forward here. We just need to accept the final vote. Again, I emphasize final. It's not final yet, but whatever the final vote is, the president needs to accept it and move on. Absolutely. Uh, thank you so much for being here. We're going to take a quick break and we're going to be right back in 60 seconds. Okay. <laughs> Welcome back to Precox's coverage of the 2020 election. Black voters in Georgia turned out in record numbers for this election and they'll be expected to do it all over again in January to determine which senators they'll be sending to Congress. Tonight, Joe Biden extended his lead there to just over 4,000 votes. The state also single-handedly determined the make will single-handedly determine the makeup of the Senate as both of their Senate races head to runoffs in January. Republican incumbent David Perdue will attempt to fend off Democratic challenger John Ossoff after slipping under Georgia's required 50% benchmark. And Reverend Raphael Warnock will battle Republican incumbent Kelly Loeffler after the two gain the most votes in the state's jungle primary. And joining me now is Reverend Warnock. I'm so happy to chat with you again. Uh, at the brink of this historic moment. Um, so first off, uh, Joe Biden is maintaining his lead. Um, and, and should he continue to do so, he would be only the third Democrat, uh, president, Democratic president to win the state in 40 years, in more than 40 years. Mm -hmm. And should you be victorious in your race, you'd be the state's first elected Democratic senator since 2000. How does that feel? Oh, we're feeling really good. Uh, this has uh, been a uh, wonderful uh, ride for me. I'm a first-time candidate, and we got in this race January 30th in the special election. And we, uh, as we began to get our message out to voters, they responded in a powerful way. And, and I'm grateful that we are uh, we finished this part of the race in such a strong position. I intend to keep carrying uh, forth my message around uh, access to affordable health care the dignity of work and voting rights. You got the most votes in Georgia's jungle primary, um, but obviously, you know, there were two Republicans in that as well. And so they split uh, the Republican vote with the race narrowed to just the two of you. Do you feel confident going into January's runoff that uh, you will be able to succeed and come out on top? Or do you expect it to be a really challenging uphill battle? Well, there were more Democrats in the race than that. There were 21 people in my race. And because the names were listed alphabetically and my last name begins with a W, I was next to the last person on the list. Um, but my message broke through, and uh, I'm grateful for the momentum that we're feeling. Uh, I, am, uh, uh, I, I think that the contrast between me uh, and uh, Kelly Leffler, who was appointed, not elected by the people of Georgia, could not be strong. Uh, she has spent a, just a few short months in uh, the Senate. She's wasted no time helping us to understand why she wanted to be there in the first place. Paid off really well for her. She's profited from the pandemic while playing it down uh, for voters. Uh, meanwhile, people in Georgia are still waiting on relief. We haven't seen a COVID-19 relief package, obviously, in months. Uh, the people that I'm talking to all across the state are concerned about their health care. They are facing unemployment, possible eviction. And they're wondering, who can they send to Washington uh, that will look out for them? Uh, I know somebody I'd like to recommend, and uh, I look forward to putting forth uh, that message in the campaign. 
In the last minute here, uh, you know, we've we've spent weeks talking about uh, the record voter turnout in Georgia. It was really incredible to see um, as early voting kicked off. What's your strategy for engaging voters uh, in the upcoming runoff? Obviously, you're going to have to do almost another sprint to the finish here. Yeah, we got less than 60 days, and so we're just going to work really hard. We're going to use every avenue we can to reach voters. I've been moving all across the state uh, 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 over the last few weeks. And, you know, the interesting thing to me, Serlina, is that I go into small towns, places where they've lost their hospital, and they're surprised that someone running for the Senate is in their town. America's Georgia, Comfort Georgia. I'm surprised that they're surprised. I'm running to be the senator for the whole state, so I ought to move around the state. Um, but I, I uh, intend to talk to ordinary people, and uh, both, you know, through these the ways in which we're moving physically across the state, but through all the various media. And I think we're building momentum that's going to tip the Senate our way and and uh, bring the kind of representation that the people of Georgia need in the U.S. Senate. Reverend Raphael Warnock, thank you so much again for joining us this evening. You're watching Peacock's continuing coverage of the presidential election. Mehdi Hassan picks up the coverage after a short break. Good night. Good evening, I'm Mehdi Hassan, back with more of Peacock's continuing special coverage of this 2020 presidential election. Pennsylvania has the electoral vote to put former Vice President Biden over the top. Nevada and Arizona together have the electoral vote to put Biden in the White House. So too would Georgia and any other state tonight. Tonight, the waiting continues as the ballots are still being counted. Let's begin by taking a look at where things stand. In Georgia, at this hour, where the Secretary of State warns that a recount is likely, well, it's still neck and neck, a difference of only 4,000 votes with 99% of the vote in, still too close to call. 
In Nevada, a judge has not granted a request brought by two Trump supporters to stop ballot counting, saying it's based on little to no evidence. So the count continues, 93% of the vote in, a 22,657 vote lead for Joe Biden. He's leading in Clark County, home to Las Vegas, 63,000 ballots there still have to be processed before being counted. He has a healthy lead there with 88% of the vote in, in Clark County, that's Nevada. Let's turn to Arizona. Biden's lead is shrinking in Arizona, but Trump is falling short of the margin he needs to capture the state's 11 electoral votes. We're expecting a new batch of results from where else? Maricopa County, within the hour. Uh, and then there's Pennsylvania. Pennsylvania, there's been a 14 point shift in that Rust Belt state from Trump to Biden in recent days. So far with 102,000 mail-in ballots left to be counted. 96% of the vote in, neck and neck, 49.5 to 49.2. Supreme Court Justice uh, Alito has just issued an order moments before I came on air. Uh, in the Pennsylvania case, uh, he's saying all of the post-Tuesday mail-in ballots must be, uh, must be still kept uh, segregated, but it does not direct officials to stop counting those votes. Keep them segregated, he says, but do not stop counting. That is not a good decision for the GOP, at least in the short run. In Philadelphia, for 24 hours now, there has been music and dancing in the streets uh, for the ballot counting now underway. A celebration of the democratic process at work in the birthplace of American democracy. It's kind of been a joyous thing to see with so much of the nation on edge stress eating their way through this week. In Alaska and North Carolina, though, President Trump is in the lead, and, and that is unlikely to change. We're looking now at North Carolina, uh, but those two states alone will not be enough to secure Donald Trump a second term. And yet the president, the sitting president, the current president made it clear today he intends to keep fighting the results of this election, even if Biden should be projected as the winner. The mayor of Philadelphia today was not dancing over that. No, I think what the president needs to do is, frankly, put his big boy pants on. He needs to acknowledge the fact that he lost and he needs to congratulate the winner, just as Jimmy Carter did, just as George H.W. Bush did, and frankly, just as Al Gore did and stop this and let us move forward as a country. Put your big boy pants on. I think someone should have said that to Donald Trump a long time ago. Look, there is precedent for how someone is expected to act after an election defeat. And guess what? Acting like a petulant toddler isn't it. When Mitt Romney lost to Barack Obama in 2012, he called and conceded. This is a photo of President Obama taking that call. Today, Senator Romney said Trump's false claims of a rigged, corrupt and stolen election damages the cause of freedom here and around the world. The last one term president, George H.W. Bush, left a letter behind on the Resolute desk for the successor who defeated him, Democrat Bill Clinton. It said that his success would be the country's success. And Bush told Clinton, quote, I am rooting hard for you. America believes in the peaceful transition of power. The nation watched as the second President Bush hugged Michelle Obama. Yeah, hugged her before helicoptering away from the Capitol on the day of the inauguration in 2009. And, by the way, he reappeared at the inauguration of Donald Trump, a man who trashed him practically daily on the campaign trail. To be fair, he was also overheard saying after Trump's speech that day, that was some weird excrement. But you have to wonder, will Trump turn up to Biden's if indeed Biden is confirmed as the winner? Will he turn up to Biden's inauguration? Look, rituals are important. Symbols are important. The handoff from one president to another assures us that in the American democratic experiment, there will be a peaceful transition of power, that there is nothing to fear. But no, today... We had to settle for the Biden campaign telling us it was prepared to escort Donald Trump out of the White House on January 20th if it comes to that. Those are fighting words. We should never forget that none of this is normal. The law and order president is abusing the law and has no interest in order. So where does this end? Where does it end? 
Joining us now are Charlotte Alter, national correspondent for Time magazine, and Jonathan Capehart, opinion writer for The Washington Post. Thank you both for sparing time in the middle of all this chaos. Jonathan, let me start with you. You have covered a fair number of elections. Uh, young man though you are, have we had any other election in our lifetime that compares to this one? No, and not even 2000. Uh, when the, the, we didn't know who the president would be for more than 30 days. The Supreme Court got involved and, this, and, and cut off the, the, the counting, and George W. Bush became president of the United States. The difference between 2000 and now is that we had two competitors who revered the Constitution. We had um, um, the person who was defeated, then Vice President Al Gore, who put country over party and his personal ambition to deliver one of the most stirring speeches he ever gave during his own campaign yes. for president, but one that healed the country, that brought the country together after uh, a, a fraught period. What we have now, as you said, I think you, call, you said a petulant toddler. That's what we have now in a president of the United States who took to the White House press briefing room yesterday uh, to deliver abominable words from a, a, a sitting president. And so, and so now I don't put anything past him. I am not surprised by anything no, that he does from here on out. At, at all. Anything and everything, anything and everything is possible. Anything and everything could happen. But he is going to go. Indeed. So, Charlotte, what do you think, where does that leave Joe Biden? What do you think it's like for him during this waiting game? He won the popular vote by millions, by the biggest margin in, in, in history, I think. He's ahead in electoral college votes in the key remaining states as of tonight. And yet day after day passes without him being able to come out and declare victory. It's a weird position to be in. Yeah, but, you know, if, if you're Joe there's one thing that you're very good at, and that is waiting. Uh, Joe Biden is somebody who, yes. from the very beginning <laughs> of this campaign, has been uh, has been working from a strategy of slow and steady wins the race. He is long on patience, ready to wait until every vote has been counted. I mean, remember, this is a guy who came in, if I'm remembering correctly, fourth in Iowa, fifth in New Hampshire. Everyone thought his campaign was dead in the and then he and then his strategy that whole time was wait until South Carolina, wait until South Carolina. We've got to count every vote in this primary process. So if he could make months of the primary where he was getting really trashed in the press and everyone thought he was a dead man, if he could make it through months of that, he can make it through a couple more hours of this. Yeah. Uh, Jonathan, Biden's taking the lead in Georgia is a surprise, even a shock to some people. Uh, what can Democrats learn from what has happened in Georgia? <laughs> Listen to Stacey Abrams, one. The second thing, though, and to be quite serious, look at what Stacey Abrams did. It's not that she ran for governor in 2018, lost, and then turned her attention to organizing Georgia. She had, she had been organizing Georgia since her time in the state legislature. And what the, what the lesson of Georgia proves is you have got to, to Charlotte's point about, about Vice President Biden, that applies to what Stacey Abrams did in Georgia. And that is identify the problem and then work continuously uh, and determinedly to change the outcome, to change the environment, and to understand from the outset that this is not going to happen in one cycle, two cycles, three cycles, or maybe even four cycles. But if you keep at it, it will happen. If anything, the folks in Texas need to look to Georgia and look to what, what Stacey Abrams did as a way of solidifying what they did. Texas came, they came very close. But I think to get it over the finish line, they need to huddle with Stacey Abrams and to really pour through what, did, what exactly did she do technically to help Georgia go from not electing a Democratic president since 92 to being sort of the surprise flip of this election. Yeah. 
It's a very good point about the lessons to be learned. Uh, Charlotte, Trump and some of his allies, of course, don't accept any of these results. They're now baselessly pushing the idea of, quote, illegal votes. Uh, this feels the same as his fake news narrative. Any reporting that Trump doesn't like is fake. Any votes that are not for him are illegal. Uh, it's not just false and dangerous, uh, but, you know, what kind of weird precedent does it set? And where does it, how does it serve him as a political argument in this moment? Well, it serves him as a political argument because it's a, it's a narrative that he can ride out of the White House, frankly. I mean, uh, there's been some reporting that, you know, that when he does leave the White House, which he will if he loses this election, um, uh, that he, that this could set him up to be sort of a uh, right-wing new media figure, maybe even start something similar to like his own version of Fox News. Um, I, I actually do think it's something, this narrative of a rigged election or fake news uh, kind of conspiring to elect Joe Biden um, really feeds into the deep and broad undercurrent of thinking that has flourished throughout the Trump presidency because he's, he's been feeding it from the bully of the, of the Oval Office. So I think that, you know, uh, even if Donald Trump is not necessary, according to the polls right now, doesn't look like he is likely to be the president next year, we haven't heard the end of him because he still has mm -hmm. a, a huge movement of people at his disposal, people who believe him more than they believe in the narrative. And that is going to be a huge undercurrent in our national politics for years yeah. to come. I think you're right. It is going to be, it is, the consequences are going to be around for a long time. This is not going to end anytime soon. Uh, Charlotte Alter, thank you so much for your insights. Jonathan, stick around for a bit longer. If Joe Biden wins, he will become the 46th president of the United States at a time of civil unrest, at a time when the pandemic is reaching historic levels, at a time when the sitting president is claiming the election is rigged and full of voter fraud. It isn't. And when Biden's running mate, Senator Kamala Harris, could become the first woman and first woman of color uh, to become second in line to be leader of the free world, so-called. Every presidential election is historic, but this one feels more historic than most. Uh, Carol Anderson joins us now. She's a professor at Emory University and author of the book White Rage, The Unspoken Truth of Our Racial Divide. Jonathan Capehart is still with us. Uh, Carol, let me start with you. In terms of iconic moments in presidential history, Nixon, 1968, Reagan, 1980, Barack Obama winning in 2008, where does this potential moment, potentially Biden defeating Trump, fit in, especially given the wider context of 2020? This is an absolutely historic election for multiple reasons. One is definitely for Kamala Harris, right? But another one yes. is because this nation is so torn. And this election was about which way. We lost, we lost Carol there right in her first answer. We're going to try and get her back. Uh, let me bring in. Let me bring in Jonathan till then while we try and fix Carol's ad. Jonathan, let me ask you this, and I'll, I'll, I'm going to go back to Carol in a moment, but if Biden becomes president-elect, given this historic moment, given this divided country, can, and it's, a, it's the cliched question, I'm going to throw it at you. I think it's a bit of a cliche, but I'm going to throw it at you anyway. Can he unite the nation? Can he bring people together? Personally, I don't think he can. I think the country is beyond that. But what do you think? Um, that is the question, and I have a lot of faith in in Joe Biden to be able to do it. I certainly know that he will try. He will do his level best to try to stitch this country back together. I mean, during the primary process, he said a couple times, more than a few times, that he viewed himself as a transitional figure, as someone who is of one generation who will transition uh, the country and the party to the next generation. That person he chose to be his running mate, Senator Kamala Harris, is somebody who is someone who is of the next generation, the next generation of leadership, who also looks like 
the rest of the country. The by 2044, yes. maybe even sooner, this is going to be no no demographic will have a demographic majority in this country. And so I do think Joe Biden, if anyone can do it. Joe Biden can. I think one of the reasons why he is on the verge of becoming the 46th president of the United States is because people see in him somebody who truly believes in this, be believes in country over party, believes in doing things for other people, um, and uh, honestly believes in, in his power to bring people together. Uh, I see we've got Carol back, so I would love to know what she has to say. And just as a yes. plug, if you have not read Carol, her book, you... read her book. Thank you. Yes, read her book. And let's go back to Carol. Jonathan and I were left in a very, uh, it was a very, it was a very dramatic moment. You said it's the most historic election because, go. Right, because the nation is really choosing which direction it's going to go in. When you think about uh, Biden, and as Jonathan was saying, he's talking about a nation where it's the nation of we, the nation where we help each other, the nation where we show passion toward each other, where when you think about what Trump is offering, it is, it is a nation of anger. It is a nation of racism. It is a nation of white supremacy. It is a nation of hatred. Um, and, and that kind of vision in the midst of the kinds of challenges that we face as a nation, was going to say a lot about how we were going to be able to deal with these challenges, like the pandemic, um, like the, the, the climate change, uh, like massive structural inequality, like police brutality and state-sanctioned violence. How do we address these in a nation of hate? Or how do we address these so, so let when we're... Yeah. Yes. So let, so let me ask you then as a follow up, you're saying, how do we address these? Could 2020 end up being the year the U.S. is forced to have a series of reckonings, a reckoning about race and racism, but also a reckoning about democracy in this country and how flawed and in some places flimsy it is, how easy it is to disenfranchise people? Oh, absolutely. And I think that that was part of what was happening actually this summer. I mean, when you saw basically 50 uh, movements out in 50 states, it was, and this questioning about how did we get here? And so you see questions about the electoral college really now coming into to, to view. You see questions about the Supreme Court and the way that it got packed by, by the Republicans and Mitch McConnell, asking the question, can we do this? How does a nation survive when it has this kind of just basic, brazen power grab. How is that a democracy? You have the same kinds of questions about the Senate. You know, so if you have a Senate yeah. that, where the majority are representing the vast minority of people, then, wow. So the questioning about democracy and how we get better as a democracy, I think that is so on the table. And I think that that was part of the reason why Biden and Harris resonated, because that was the combination that could allow this nation to have that conversation. It's a very good point about the, the resonating. But Jonathan, there's also a lot of talk about repudiation this week and how this election wasn't necessarily a repudiation of Trump mm. that many wanted to see, at least at least not a repudiation by the white majority. Do you agree with that? Uh, yeah, <laughs> that, that was one of the things uh, the morning after the election that, you know, really had me in a very in a sort of contemplative state. Um, really, the entirety of, of Trump's uh, term has had me in, in that state because the country that I thought I knew, the country that I thought I grew up in, elected this guy. And then to see, as time went along, the numbers of people who continued to support the guy, despite um, Charlottesville, despite the Muslim ban, despite babies in cages on the border, who are still there, by the way, uh, and yet they still support him. And now to, to wake up the day after the election and to see that a majority of white people, actually, in some cases, yeah 
in many states more than in 2016 supported him was very was very dispiriting. But, you know, in this time of Trump, I've spent a lot of time reading a lot of history, reading a lot of books like Carol's, getting a lot of perspective in understanding. And especially this is what was so important about reading, reading Carol's book and why what we what we're witnessing in terms of the white majority in this country, this is part of a cycle. And, you know, the eight years of Obama was a shock to the white majority of the country. And as Carol ar argues in her book, that the backlash led us to Trump. And it, it is my hope, back to your, uh, your earlier question to me, that Joe Biden will be a part of the pendulum swinging back the other way, but it is not gonna swing back quickly because we're looking at yes. 69 million Americans who voted for who voted for President Trump's re-election? We are a divided country, but at least now um, with Trump, the one positive thing I can point to of his administration is he ripped he ripped the covers off things that have been roiling yes. under the surface in this country for generations. Now the genie's out of the bottle, can't put it back in, and we have to talk about it. We have to. I agree with you. And a lot of what we're going to be talking about tonight is the genie being out of the bottle. Jonathan Capehart, thank you so much for your time. Carol, you're Thanks, sticking baby. around. We appreciate that. Uh, we'll talk so much more about all of this. So much more to come. We're going to talk about fishers, divisions, maybe. Are they really divisions? In the Republican Party, as some stand up to the president belatedly, and others, of course, man the barricades. And as we go to a, a break, a reminder... It's COVID, COVID, COVID. You can't watch anything else. On November 4th, you won't be hearing so much about it. On November 4th, you'll announce, okay, now we're going to open. Here's what happens. November 4th, you won't hear too much about it. They'll probably announce it on November 4th. We're going to open up now. On November 4th, you'll hear we're doing extremely well. On November 4th, the day after the election, they're going to open it up. On November 4th, you'll hear... It's getting better. Over 120,000 new COVID cases were diagnosed in the US today, a grim single day record. That was last night. A reminder, COVID is on the rise and the president has no plan to stop it. He is more focused on undermining democracy. That clip of me speaking, giving the news about the 100,000 plus cases from last night. And we just learned the United States broke the record again tonight. Not a record you want to break. Back after 60 seconds here on Peacock. Welcome back to Peacock. It's important to remember waiting for ballots to be counted in a presidential election is nothing unusual. What is very strange is the presidential effort to try and stop it. To do that, Trump and his party are resorting to the same tactic they always do, fear-mongering. For instance, Republican State Senator Jake Corman admits there's no signs of tampering, but he's still stoking questions. I don't have any evidence of any misdoing. Uh, but for all their actions is leading to wondering why they didn't want people watching this process. Didn't allow poll watchers in the in the pre-voting. Mm -hmm. uh, they didn't allow them to get close enough to see what was going on um, in the current voting and uh, the current count. 
He doesn't have any evidence of wrongdoing. Full stop, right? Not quite. But if you can keep from getting caught up in the hype, cooler heads will prevail. An official under Georgia's Republican Secretary of State, who the president has assailed, uh, gave an update to dispel rumors of widespread voter fraud in Georgia. And just a preemptive question, I know it's going to come up, are we seeing any widespread fraud? Are we seeing anything that makes us question the outcome of the election? We're not seeing any widespread irregularities. We're not seeing anything widespread. We are, we are investigating any credible uh, accusation with any real evidence behind it. So look, there is a lot of energy being put into scaring people into believing this election is being stolen when it's not. And even the guy who was trying to scare you said there's no evidence of what he wants you to be scared of. Bizarre. To talk about this post-game attempt at voter disenfranchisement, because that's what it really is, uh, let's bring back Professor Carol Anderson. We're also joined by Latosha Brown, co-founder of the Black Voters Matter Fund. Uh, Latosha, let me start with you. Uh, we have claims of voter fraud from the president, but as you just heard there, official after official is coming out to say there is no grounds for claiming that. Trump supporters have showed up to try and stop ballot counts in multiple places across the country, um, from voter intimidation at the polls to voter intimidation in terms of counting the results. The president seems bent on disenfranchising voters, often voters of color. Absolutely, because at his very core, he's a fascist. And we have to accept that, that he is a fascist. This is the definition of fascism. The bottom line is, in a democracy, you're saying, stop, you're telling your, your supporters to stop, to do a, a don't count the votes. I mean, that in itself is a very def definition of it. So it, once again, it's political theater. I think that he's trying to find a way to buy himself some time to figure out ways that he can put distrust in the numbers. Um, and also, I think he's looking for a way to steal the election. Yes. He has been very open from the beginning. I think this has been a setup. We've saw this coming for weeks. So we should not be shocked at his behavior. He's been pretty consistent the last four years. It's interesting here you say he's trying to steal the election. It's classic Trump projection. Whatever he accuses his opponents of doing, it's often what he's thinking or doing at the same time. Uh, Professor Anderson, since uh, Trump can't get his mobs to successfully shut down the ballot counting, he and his party are turning to the courts. NBC's Pete Williams reported earlier two Republican congressmen have filed uh, a suit alleging thousands of ineligible people cast ballots. Uh, the latest there is that a federal judge has shot down that. Uh, that suit. Uh, the Supreme Court also rejected Republican demands to stop counts in Pennsylvania. I wonder, in your view, is this about actually trying to win a legal battle or is this just laying the political groundwork to delegitimize another Democratic presidency? Uh, this is absolutely about delegitimizing uh, a Democratic presidency, but also delegitimizing democracy. Um, so Sorry. what Latasha Brown said about um, being a fascist, being um, an authoritarian, um, about wanting to have this kind of dynastic rule, um, about wanting to actually rule and not govern. All of that is about stripping away the institutions of democracy. And one of those key institutions is the vote. And he, but understand, he's building on decades of work by the Republicans to yell voter fraud, voter fraud, voter fraud. They're stealing the election. They're stealing the election. And so what Trump is, Trump is symptomatic of a larger eel yes. within the Republican Party. Indeed, and I think you're right to make that point about him being symptomatic. A lot of times we get, we miss that point. It's a very important point. Uh, Latasha, Georgia has been so reliably read for so long and it seems to be flipping on one of the furthest right candidates this country has ever seen. Uh, what role did the black vote play there? And what happened in Georgia? Can it be replicated in other parts of the Deep South? Absolutely. I think that when you look at what happened in Georgia, what I always say is that the South is red until it ain't. Right. And so fundamentally, what I think happened is you saw a level of investment and deep organizing. I think there were several factors. 
One, I think the fact of voter suppression of what black voters experienced in the state of Georgia in 2018 became the fuel that fed this fire, that we organized deeply in the last two years. There are organizations that have been doing massive voter registration, have been working together as a coalition. And what you see in Georgia is you see a new South rising. You see a coalition of members of the Asian American, um, of Pacific Islander population, of African Americans, of progressive whites. There's a new coalition that has formed in the state of Georgia. Georgia, and I think we're seeing the evidence of that. This is what happens when you have deep organizing and when you have the ability in, a, in an election like we had this time for people to who are really upset with not being able to have their voice heard. What I do believe is they went too far, and this is a backlash for those who have tried to marginalize yes. our vote and marginalize our voice. And you mentioned marginalize your vote and vote. Your organization has done a lot of work at getting people out to vote, getting people registered. It's worth pointing out to viewers because I mean, people don't realize when we talk about the gap in Georgia is down to a few thousand votes. This is after Republicans purged hundreds of thousands of people from the Georgia electoral rolls. That's why it's down to a few thousand votes. Absolutely. Just this in October 2019, Raffensperger actually dropped 328,000 people from the voting rolls. Two of those, 200,000 of those 328,000 never should have been dropped. Many of them were African American voters. Many of them, if they did not know that they were dropped from the voting rolls, which they should not have been in the first place, if they did not register, re register by October the 5th, they were denied the opportunity to vote in this election. We have seen an onslaught, a coordinated, concerted effort to marginalize the voices of black voters, right? But just as we did in the 60s, just as we've done all throughout our history, we're on the vanguard of believing in democracy. We've organized ourselves. And what has made the difference in the state of Georgia has been black voters and organized black voting power. Uh, Carol, I want to uh, bring you in and ask you a question about the late uh, John Lewis of Georgia, because there's a lot of talk about how Donald Trump went after late Congressman John Lewis. He attacked him during his life, didn't show him the respect he deserved when he died. Uh, and now you're seeing Georgia and Atlanta and the home of John Lewis playing a pivotal role in taking the presidency away from Donald Trump, perhaps. Yeah. <laughs> um, one of the things I remember, John Lewis was my congressman. And I remember the, the horrible way that, you know, Trump tweeted, uh, you know, go to your drug infested, crime ridden, because for, for, for Trump, anything that is black is crime ridden and drug infested. Again, probably projection. Um, but what we're, we're seeing was that just like the way that the 2018 uh, gubernatorial election here in Georgia really ticked folks off, it's the same way with the massive disrespect that, that, that Trump showed to Congressman John Lewis showed to his legacy, showed he's like, oh, I don't know, he did something, I don't even know. I mean, that kind of dismissiveness, just all of that with the organizing coming in from Fair Fight, coming in from Black Voters Matter, coming in from Asian Americans Advancing Justice, coming in yes. from the New Georgia Project, coming in, all of those incredible voices and organizing and fueled by a, a real sense that another four years of Trump may be the last years of the United States of America and would put our lives, our very lives at risk in ways that we hadn't seen yeah. since the 1950s in the Deep South. And so it was mobilized, organized, and so you saw people standing in line for, you know, 11 hours here in Georgia, yeah. voter suppression, saying, I'll vote like my, because my life depends on it. Yeah. And they've had an impact. And those lines had an impact. Watching the Trump lead uh, disappear in Georgia over the last three nights has really been a sight to behold. Uh, we've been covering it here on Peacock, and it's been remarkable. Carol Anderson and Latosha Brown, thank you so much for your time and your insights. We appreciate it. Coming up at 9 o'clock, we're expecting to get 65,000 more ballots from Maricopa County. That will be a big deal. But first, a walk down memory lane. A walk down a racist white nationalist memory lane. 
back with more in 90 seconds. With Joe Biden moving ahead in Georgia, Pennsylvania and Nevada, it's looking like we may really be nearing the end of the Trump presidency. But before we set our sights on a historic new era in the White House, I can't help feel nostalgic for all the wonderful moments we've shared with this president. Take a look. When Mexico sends its people, they're not sending their best. They're not sending you. They're not sending you. They're sending people that have lots of problems, and they're bringing those problems with us. They're bringing drugs. They're bringing crime. They're rapists. Excuse me, to protest. Excuse me, they didn't put themselves down as you. And you had some very bad people in that group. But you also had people that were very fine people on both sides. Omar has a history of launching vicious, anti-Semitic screeds. And then I see the disinfectant, where it knocks it out in a minute, one minute. And is there a way we can do something like that uh, by injection inside or, or almost a cleaning? Because you see it gets on the lungs and it does a tremendous number of the lungs. So it'd be interesting to check that. So that you're going to have to use medical doctors with. But it sounds, it sounds interesting to me. Do you want to call them? What do you want to call them? Give me a name. Give me a white name. White supremacist and right. Who would you like me to condemn? White supremacist and right. Proud boys. Proud boys. Stand back and stand by. But I'll tell you what. I'll tell you what. Somebody's got to do something about Antifa and the left. We all know there's much more where that came from. That's just what we have time for tonight. But if you're not ready to hang up your MAGA hat and clear all Trump rallies from your schedule, here's a glimmer of hope from former acting White House Chief of Staff Mick Mulvaney. I would absolutely expect the, the president to stay involved in politics and would absolutely put him on the short list of people who are likely to run in 2024. Trump 2024. Go back to keeping making America great again, again or something. Still ahead, the messaging melee that Republicans are currently facing. We're back in 60 seconds.
You could say there are three types of Republicans. There are those that are publicly silent and privately disgusted by the president's ongoing efforts to undermine the results. Then there are those who have stood up publicly. Your Mitt Romney types. Two Republican military veterans were seething. Denver Riggleman said, stop the Bravo Sierra, Mr. President. I'll let you figure out the letters that stands for. And Pennsylvania Senator Pat Toomey acknowledged the president still has a path to victory, but undermined the president's argument of widespread voter fraud. I saw the president's speech last night, and uh, it was very hard to watch. Uh, the president's allegations of large-scale fraud and theft of the election are just not substantiated. Is there any evidence that I'm aware of that there is significant large-scale fraud or malfeasance anywhere in Pennsylvania? Absolutely not. But there is another wing of the party that is taking a much different tack. You could argue it's the biggest wing. Senator-elect Tommy Tuberville, the former Auburn coach, uh, making completely irrelevant use of a football metaphor. Uh, Twitter threw a flag on that tweet. And then there's these people. Yet Philadelphia and yet Detroit and yet Las Vegas, they sit in a darkened room in Detroit. They covered up the windows so no one could look at them. And, and it is only the hard Democratic cities where they know what the total is, that they got to get the votes, that they got to try to beat the president, and they don't want anyone watching them. It is outrageous. I talked with the president this afternoon, Sean, and I'll tell you, the president is angry, and I'm angry, and the voters ought to be angry. President Trump won this election, so everyone who's listening, do not be quiet. Do not be, do not be silent about this. We cannot allow this to happen before our very eyes. We unite together. Senator Ted Cruz, House Minority Leader Kevin McCarthy, talking nonsense, faux outrage even. So look, while Democrats hoped a rout of the Republicans this week would be the end of Trumpism, it now seems to be baked in, Trumpism that is, into the Republican Party. Joining me now is staff writer for The Atlantic, McKay Coppins, who has written extensively about the GOP and about the Trump effect. Uh, McKay, fast forward uh, to the end of December, and let's say the trends hold, Joe Biden is elected, uh, and this president continues to tweet and undermine the election. What does the GOP do next? Do they cut him loose at any point? Well, I think it's going to be interesting to see because the reality will be that by December, Donald Trump, I would imagine, will still be the most popular Republican in the party, right? He will still be the single figure with the most supporters, with the most fans, uh, the one who has the most influence and power in the party. Uh, there will be people, you name some of them, and there will be probably more who, once the election is called, will distance themselves from him, uh, if only because they're thinking about their own political futures. But it's also true that, uh, just as you said, the Trump's defeat is not going to be the end of Trumpism. And in fact, I think Trump's defeat might serve to radicalize an element of his base even further and kind of create uh, the idea that this was a rigged election as kind of an article of faith within the party, or at least within the hardcore MAGA crowd. Indeed, the, the kind of the new birtherism, but much more dangerous and widespread. Uh, we've seen what happens to Republicans like Mark Sanford or Justin Amash or Jeff Flake, who stand up to the president. They tend to get run out of the party. Um, what is at stake for others who are like them and still in office? You mentioned that Trump will still be the most popular Republican with the base. But do you think you'll see you know, senators thinking, well, actually, I don't need him in my state or in my race I don't need him. It's, it's savvier, clever of me to run away from him and pretend I never had anything to do with him. Yeah, you know, if we're looking at it purely from like a craven political standpoint, I think that there is a hope among the, the kind of establishment Republican crowd that the allure of Trump and his influence with the base will start to fade once he is seen as a loser, right? Once it becomes clear that he lost the election, uh, once his kind of ranting and raving starts to look more pathetic than indignant, uh, there are going to be a lot of people on Capitol Hill, a lot of Republicans, who are hoping that they can, they can just forget him and move away from him without too much punishment from the base. I think that'll be true in some states. Um, but I also think that there's going to be this other force that, that's taking place within the party, which is that there will be this kind of 
uh, effort to memory hole this whole four year period, right? There will be an effort to, uh, to kind of bring about a Republican amnesia yeah. where uh, the, a whole bunch of Republicans are going to start talking about the deficit. They're going to start talking about alleged uh, corruption by oh, the yeah. Biden family. They're, <laughs> they're going to kind of hope that they can wave a magic wand and make the electorate forget uh, how they behaved and what they supported over the past four years so that they can pivot back to it's, timeless it's, conservative principles. And I'm not sure that it'll work with a lot of voters. Yeah, I don't think it will anytime soon, not with a big chunk of the country. It's what they tried to do after George W. Bush, of course. Remember, a lot of them tried to kind of disown the Bush presidency and the deficits and the Iraq war, etc. Mm -hmm. um, what's interesting is Don Jr. yesterday, the president's uh, probably loudest son, uh, went on Twitter and said, where are all the 2024 hopefuls? Why aren't they yeah. speaking up for my dad, for the president? <laughs> and immediately they fell into line. Nikki, Nikki Haley came out and said, count every legal vote and all the nonsense, the Trump nonsense. Uh, Tom Cotton, the Senator came out. It's amazing to me. I know you've written about the Trump children, but it's amazing to me that this family, it's not just that Trump controls the GOP. It's, it's, it's worse than a kind of, it Don is. Jr. used the phrase banana republic yesterday. It's worse than like the worst failed states in the developing world, where this family now controls the party of Lincoln and Eisenhower. It, 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 it's been remarkable to watch Don Jr. and Eric go out there and really act like kind of part of the, a mafia family where they were, you know, conducting a shakedown on the Republican Party and saying, you know, uh, you better get out there and do what we say or else some bad things are going to happen to your, your no future career. Uh, Don Jr., I think in particular, is setting himself up for a future in the party, whether that's a presidential run, a run for office in some Western state. Uh, I know that I, I've reported before that that's been discussed in his circles, that he might run for Senate in a place like Montana. Um, I, I think that the, the interesting friction that we're going to see uh, in that whole situation is that I'm not sure Donald Trump himself is going to be ready to hand the torch to his son. He doesn't actually want... Yes, uh, I, was about, I, was about, I was about to ask you that, McKay. I was about to ask you that and say, Mick Mulvaney is saying Trump could run again in 2024. Exactly. So where does that leave the children? You've written about Ivanka and Don wanting to run. Could all three Trumps run mm -hmm. in 2024? God help us all. <laughs> run against each other in a, in a very Trumpy Republican primary. No, I mean, this is actually going to be one of the frustrations for Don Jr. and Ivanka, that their dad is just not going to leave the stage. And frankly, this is going to be a frustration for the Republican Party, too, because the reality is, as much as they hope that they can kind of let him slink away and, uh, and bring about this amnesia, the reality is he's going to be tweeting constantly, giving interviews constantly, possibly creating his own network, talking about running again for 2024. It, it is going to be very difficult to ignore Donald Trump if you are a Republican over the next few years. I think you put your finger on it. And that's uh, one of the reasons I wanted to talk to you about all this, because you're right. Uh, it is going to be very hard. And I think it is the Trumpy, the Trumpy party now. Uh, McKay Coppins, staff writer at The Atlantic. Uh, thank you so much for your time and talking Donald Trump and the GOP with me. Appreciate it. I want to continue this conversation now and talk about the Democrats and where they are and what they do next uh, with activist and host of the podcast Undistracted, Brittany Packnett Cunningham. Also with me, contributing op-ed writer for The New York Times, uh, Wajahat Ali. Uh, let's talk about what some are calling an emerging split. It was already a split, but emerging in the wake of this election uh, in the Democratic Party, um, especially in the wake of uh, some of the comments made this week. Uh, Wajat, let's start with you. Democrats are masters, in my view, of the circular firing squad, even at a time when they should be getting ready to celebrate and talk about the potential getting back of the presidency from Donald Trump. Uh, you have the recriminations have already started uh, about who's to blame for the House uh, who's to blame for the Senate? Which ideas? Um, what do you make of all these recriminations that are going on right now? Yeah, Democrats are incapable of actually realizing that they're in the end zone. They have won. They have scored. The, the clock is done. There's no review, and they can just get to spike the ball. Uh, this is Democrats being Democrats, and they're always held hostage by the narrative constructed by the Republicans. So somehow Joe Biden's going to win 80 million votes. He's going to win by more than 7 million votes. He's going to flip five states. And instead of saying, yo, we won and we're in a, uh, a, a structurally 
disadvantageous system that does not reward the popular vote thanks to the Electoral College and gerrymandering and voter suppression. Instead, we're going to whine and moan and just boohoo ourselves. And actually, instead of uniting, we're going to crush each other and we're going to go against the squad and not actually have our, 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 our people like held together. Democrats need to come up with better messaging. You cannot blame AOC for knowing how to message properly, for knowing how to use Instagram, and for being a progressive with her base. If Spanberger and others want to improve, message better, learn Instagram, learn yeah. Twitter, learn so, to be passionate and inspire your base. That's my message and takeaway. So, so it's a nice segue into my next question, which I'll put to you, Brittany. There was this heated conference call yesterday uh, between House Democrats. Uh, Why well, mentioned Spanberger, Congresswoman Abigail Spanberger, who flipped her more conservative district in Virginia in 2018, uh, held on to it narrowly this time around. She was furious on the call, saying, basically, stop talking about socialism, stop talking about defunding the police, although I'm not sure which Democrats, you know, Joe Biden wasn't talking about defunding the police. Uh, and it's, cost, you know, it's costing them seats, she said. Uh, do you agree with that? Number A, is her argument correct? B, is this the time to be having it? Well, here's the thing. I think that we have clear evidence that there are um, uh, proposals and issue areas that are incredibly important to the American people, whether or not folks who are made uncomfortable by them want to admit it. This race was decided by people of color. It was decided by some of the most progressive voters in the entire country who understood that they needed to use this election to reduce harm and create better conditions for our organizing in the future administration. That doesn't mean that everyone who voted for Joe Biden is really, really excited about all of the proposals um, that he put forth. And in order to truly unite the Democratic Party, then we have to actually be the party of inclusion that we say that we are. We have to actually include all of the ideas and the folks who brought this victory home and make sure that their needs and their concerns are adequately addressed. Because the thing about it is, voters of color, young voters, marginalized voters, they are waking up today and will wake up tomorrow thinking expressly about just how much power we have, about the power to decide and change the fate of entire elections. And the Democrats will have four years to really show and prove that they're ready to invest in those communities, that they're ready to meet and reward yes. that effort with real policy. And I'm worried about what will happen to the party in four years if that doesn't happen. So I actually don't think this is the time to be poo-pooing uh, progressive voters and voters of color and, and what people call identity politics. I actually think we have to, to recognize the value in those things. And if we're a big tent party, open up the tent. And, and, you know, to your point, uh, we had Congresswoman Rashida Tlaib, who, who kept her seat in Michigan and boosted turnout massively there. Uh, she was on the show yesterday. She was pushing back pretty hard. Uh, Congresswoman Ocasio-Cortez today pushed back very hard, as Wajat mentioned on Twitter. Um, and then you have Mitch McConnell, which is which is what amuses me. In the midst of all this, there's Mitch McConnell waiting in the wings to do what he does best. Uh, what Joe Biden is going to face, possibly, depending on what happens in Georgia, in January, a Republican-led Senate again, uh, as Barack Obama did for much of his presidency. He could struggle to appoint his cabinet. Uh, Jeff Hauser of Revolving Door Project, uh, he was telling the Washington Post today, look, Joe Biden does not need to make Mitch McConnell co-president. Uh, Biden just needs to realize it. You and I, Waj, have talked for many years about how Republicans bring a rocket launcher to a gun fight, Democrats bring a sternly worded letter. Do you think the Democrats right. under Biden are ready to bring their own, their own metaphorical rocket launcher? So I said this earlier today on Twitter, and I pissed off a lot of right-wingers. I said the following. You have to recognize that the Republican Party in its current form is an extremist minority party that is a counter-majoritarian party. They will not help you in any way, shape, or form. Mitch McConnell bragged to this day that he was an obstructionist for Barack Obama. What makes you think that they'll help Joe Biden, who they've painted into a radical socialist? Joe Biden. And one thing Democrats can learn is now you have a QAnon nut, Marjorie Green Taylor, an extremist in the House. And guess what? The Republicans are always going to close ranks and they'll tease her once in a while. They'll like, push yeah. back, but they'll close ranks. So what you have to do is you have to treat them like the hostile minority party that they are. I said establish a war room, a media messaging campaign, attack, attack, attack. You got 2022 coming up. That's when you can go full red wedding. And this is what Joe Biden has to say. Message, message, message. I'm trying to get you guys COVID relief. 
Why, Mitch McConnell, are you stopping COVID relief? I'm trying to spend on infrastructure. Why, Mitch McConnell, are you trying to stop? I'm trying to expand health care. Why, Mitch McConnell, are you and all the Republicans in the Senate and the House trying to stop me from helping all but Americans? Hold on, hold on, hold on. I get, I get the strategy, but is Joe Biden going to do it? Yes or no? It's all very well saying he, he should do this. Do you do think it, he is going to do it? Going, he's going to be sacrificing himself. Democrats have to realize the American people have given them a mandate, 80 million votes. You've won by about 7 million votes. You can spike the ball. You can blow. Okay. You can be like Kaepernick. Do the Superman. Own it that you're a progressive. Center okay. people of color gave you this election. Don't. Well, you can't say you can't say do the Superman anymore because now we know that Donald Trump wanted to do the Superman, so it's ruined the whole thing. Brittany, before we run out of time, let me just talk about this Senate race, the double Senate race coming up in Georgia, possibly the the runoffs. Right? Question: All this arguing among House Democrats, progressives, moderates, etc. Which way is the right way to go? What was the right message? What won us this election? What lessons should Pastor Raphael Warnock uh, and, and John Ossoff? What should they learn? from this election, from this week, from this result, as they go into the fights of their lives come January? To build relationships and invest in BIPOC uh, organizers, door knockers, canvassers, and strategists. We know how to get folks out. Look, I've been a part of a, a group of a bunch of white women, a, a bunch of black women rather, and our tagline is win with black women. Not just because black women are brilliant on the ticket as we've seen Senator Kamala Harris be, but also because we know how to turn out votes. We know how to get the message across and we know how to get people from inspired to actually casting a ballot. The lesson here is to invest in the people who bring it home during the campaign and then to make sure that you're investing in them when you actually make your way onto the Senate floor. They are the, the very people who can help us unlock some of the most important progressive policies that we need. And we have to make sure that they actually are investing in the communities that need that the most so that they can show up for them. Maybe can I say one thing? Five seconds. What I love so much. Five seconds, because we're out of time. Five seconds. Go. Democrats, stop chasing Karen. Start chasing Stacey Abrams. Stop chasing Karen. Karen didn't show up for you. <laughs> That's right. Okay. What I always enjoy about having you on, both of you, Wajahat and Brittany, is you don't hold back. And that's what I love talking about with you guys. We're going to both be back, I believe, in an hour's time. So we appreciate you coming back in an hour. In our next hour, we'll unpack the latest numbers from Arizona. And I'll be joined by former RNC chairman Michael Steele and Philadelphia District Attorney Larry Krasner as the Trump campaign tries to win in the courts instead of with ballots. Back in 90 seconds here on Peacock. Don't go away.
As we hit the top of the hour, I'm Mehdi Hassan, back with more of Peacock's continuing special coverage of the 2020 presidential election. 147 million votes have been counted, and Joe Biden's popular vote lead is now at more than four and a half million. The path that brought the Biden-Harris ticket to the verge of victory tonight was not smooth for either one of them. Harris dropped out of the primaries in December before the voting had even started. And this is Joe Biden's third run for the presidency. As 2020 began, it looked like this attempt could also fail. Biden finished well behind his leading Democratic rivals in Iowa and New Hampshire. But America loves nothing more than a comeback story. And South Carolina's black voters delivered that comeback for him, sending Biden on his way to the Democratic presidential nomination and to where we are tonight. And where we are tonight is expecting another batch of new results from Maricopa County in Arizona. I'd say this is one of the little things we've come to look forward to every night. But these ballots have proven to be a very big thing in the Arizona presidential contest. Here's how Arizona is looking at this hour. Joe Biden has a very narrow lead, 36,816 votes separate him from Donald Trump with 94% of the vote in. Too close to call, according to the NBC decision desk. In Delaware County, Pennsylvania, 20,000 more votes have pushed Joe Biden's statewide lead even higher. Pittsburgh's Allegheny County began counting its ballots today. That's right, began. Officials say they also received 1,000 more ballots today that were postmarked before Election Tuesday, and they will count those too. In Georgia, Biden's lead jumped today after more votes came in from Gwinnett County in metro Atlanta. The margin in that state is so close that officials say they are planning for a likely recount. 4,020 votes, that's it. That's all that separates Biden from Trump. Now look, Donald Trump isn't used to losing. He isn't used to losing, at least he isn't used to losing anything except money. He's lost a lot of money. He doesn't know how to lose gracefully either. This guy was a bad winner in 2016. And he made it clear today that he intends to keep fighting even as the numbers are increasingly not on his side. Much was made this afternoon that the tone of his statement was different, but its message and the actions he took were very much the same as ever. The Republican Party is dispatching legal teams to Arizona and to Georgia and to Pennsylvania and to Michigan. The Republican governor of Georgia is looking for lawyers to make sure the count is fair and transparent, not in the entire state, but only in the counties where Biden is leading. Funny that. In Pennsylvania, the GOP asked the Supreme Court to stop the count of any ballots received after Election Day. Tonight, uh, Justice Alito, a conservative justice, issued an order saying that mail-in ballots received after Tuesday in Pennsylvania must be segregated. But he also said the count should continue, disappointing the GOP in the process. It does not matter that the courts have already begun to dismiss the Trump campaign's existing uh, lawsuits. Uh, a judge in Michigan today said one of Trump's cases was backed by hearsay within hearsay. Hmm. For the president that has told 22,000 lies and counting, hearsay is what passes for evidence. Facts have an alternative. And bluster has gotten him all the way to the Oval Office. Trump's legal challenges may not have enough merit to keep him in the White House, but they can still do a lot of damage as he clings desperately to power. I'm joined now by Jeff. Oh, we've got so look, Arizona. Let me just bring up Arizona for a moment for our next guest. Arizona, the, the, the Maricopa County vote is in. Joe Biden's lead in Arizona shrinks to 29,000 votes. So 53,000 between them and Maricopa County, 29,000 statewide. Still not enough for Trump to make up the difference and take the Electoral College votes from Arizona. I think 11 votes in Arizona, 95% of the vote in. Maricopa still counting and still causing headlines. So we'll keep an eye on Arizona as the time goes by. This is what we do now every night, every day, every waking moment. We check Arizona. We check Georgia. I'm joined now by Jeff Mason, White House correspondent for Reuters. Uh, Jeff, thanks so much for taking time out of a chaotic week. Uh, what's the mood inside the White House as these results, like we're seeing in Arizona, trickle in hour after hour? The road to victory, despite that little bump he got in Arizona just now, is still getting slimmer for Trump, isn't it? Well, it's certainly getting slimmer for Trump, for President Trump, no question about that. However, 
that little sliver of good news from Arizona is definitely something that they will be watching closely. Uh, Trump officials have been saying for days now that they still expect uh, good news out of Arizona, and they were inf infuriated that uh, Fox News and AP ended up calling Arizona for Vice President Biden. So they're watching that closely and uh, still expecting from their view that they can pull out a win. And if they do, uh, then the, the narrow path that the president still has uh, to getting to 270 electoral college votes uh, gets a little bit of a boost. That doesn't mean that he's got a uh, nearly as good of a chance as Vice President Biden. That is clear. Uh, but it, uh, it does give yes. them something to hold on to. And of course, Arizona, this traditionally red state that I think he expected to hold on to, uh, he's narrowed the gap tonight, but he was supposed to get, I think he needed to get something like 59, 60% out of Maricopa's latest returns. He got 54%. So still not going as well as he needs it to go. And here's my question to you, Jeff. This Trump full court press to stop the count. Is that something, not in Arizona, but elsewhere, they're happy for it to carry on in Arizona. Is that something everybody is on board with inside the White House on Team Trump? Because in 2000, the Republicans had James Baker. This time around, they can't really get a James Baker figure. They've got David Bossie. They've got Rudy Giuliani. I just wonder how many people are really on board with this outside of, like, Trump, Jared Kushner, Stephen Miller, Rudy Giuliani? Sure. Well, I spoke to a bunch of sources today about that. And broadly, I think that there's sort of there's mixed emotions about the whole thing. Uh, there were people, there are Republicans who are frustrated that the Trump campaign hasn't articulated a more coherent legal strategy. They feel like this, the legal strategy has been sort of knee jerk, jump at this state, jump at that state. Uh, and they were frustrated by that. I spoke to one source, a former White House official, who also said, Look, uh, Republicans are waiting for the evidence uh, of fraud and election stealing that the president referred to from the podium at the White House on Thursday night. That said, uh, they are also fine to see the president continue to fight uh, for reasons like what we're seeing in Arizona. They don't they don't think it's time to give up uh, because they still believe that there are votes out there that could go the president's way. So they're not all polishing off their resumes, updating them, getting ready for uh, other jobs quite yet. Uh, Jeff, if Biden is called the winner, if he does end up being the winner, uh, we know that doesn't mean that the end of... We know that this is not the end for Trump. He's not going to give up the fight, as you just mentioned. What do you expect his next move is going to be? And do we think we will ever see a... You've, you spent a lot of time around this president, press conferences on Air Force One. Is this a man <laughs> who's ever going to give a concession speech? Well, that's a great question, uh, whether he will give an, a concession speech and also whether he will call or, or to receive or make a call to Vice President Joe Biden. Um, I, it's, it's definitely not something that would come easily to him. And he referred to that, actually, when he went to his campaign headquarters on Election Day, saying that it's, it's easy to win, it's hard to lose, it's especially hard for me, he said. So I, I don't know the answer to that question. I do know that there are people around him who, though they want him to continue fighting right now, are not committed to his sort of questioning of a peaceful transfer. So if it ends up uh, that it's, that Vice President Biden is a clear winner and wants the, the, this current president has gone yeah. through uh, the legal challenges, I, I think that he probably will end up conceding in some way. Let's see what happens. Thank you, Jeff Mason, so much for your time. It's been a very busy week in Philadelphia. The birthplace of the American experiment has seen an influx of protesters, lawyers, and even gunmen, as officials continue to tally ballots in the most populous city in Pennsylvania. Ballots that could decide the presidency. Rudy Giuliani has been there, threatening lawsuits, alleging voter fraud, with no evidence, of course. It's Rudy Giuliani. And on Thursday night, two Virginia men with a bunch of QAnon paraphernalia were arrested near the ballot counting operation for illegally carrying loaded pistols in the city as tensions remain high. Joining us now is Philadelphia District Attorney Larry Krasner. Uh, Larry, thanks so much for coming back on the show. Um, can I start by asking you about the election itself? Trump today uh, watching Fox News and tweeting that, quote, Philadelphia her, yes, he misspelled it, has got a rotten history on election integrity. Uh, later on, before we went air, he also tweeted that legal proceedings are just beginning and complained that the Pennsylvania governor and Supreme Court broke the law. Do you have any idea what he's on about, what lawsuits he's planning to push through? 
I almost never have any idea what he's on about uh, because he is completely divorced from truth or fact. And he also is kind of a dope. So when you mix all this together, it's quite a brew. Um, I really don't know what he's talking about. There is no history in Philadelphia of any kind of significant voter fraud. The notion that we're going to listen to Rudy Giuliani use the word fraud and not watch it boomerang and punch him back in the face, because, I mean, we all know what Rudy is. This whole thing is it's this bizarre political theater where they uh, basically describe themselves and turn that into an accusation for everyone yes. else and everything else. Pure projection. Yeah, I think you, you hit the nail on the head. It's all projection. We're seeing a lot of loud crowds, uh, some of them angry, some of them actually having fun and upbeat in Philadelphia. Uh, you're in charge of law enforcement. Are you worried things might get out of hand as the days go by, as the final results come in? Is this something that you're worried about or is it all under control? Well, the really good news is we had a very, very smooth election day, no intimidation, no goofy guys thinking they're G.I. Joe out there lining up with their you know, little outfits and stuff. None of that. It all went very smoothly. And what, and what you're seeing now on the screen is really typical of most of what's going on is people dancing in the street. We got Elmo out there dancing in the street. Who doesn't love that? We have Gritty out there dancing. It's a beautiful display of democracy and everything that's wonderful and weird about big cities. And then on the other side, you have, you know, a sort of a morose, uh, relatively small crew of pro-Trump people who are also being nonviolent. I mean, there's nothing wrong with this. But we did have a, a kind of dark moment last night when a couple guys drove up from Virginia in their Hummer, people who purport to be uh, representing veterans for, for Trump. And they figured the only way to go into the city of Philadelphia was with a, a gun, a uh, handgun on each of them. And in the back of the vehicle was an AR-type uh, rifle with over 160 rounds. Um, there is more to it. I know a lot more to it because I've had an opportunity to delve into the investigation. That investigation is ongoing. And they do have all kinds of stickers and a hat and so on affiliating them. With QAnon, as you know, that is either frightening or foolish. You're never really sure because QAnon is actually a group that believes there's a satanic bunch of people who are pedophiles and are, are running a sex yes. ring. OK, I mean, that's what we're dealing with. And sometimes it's in a pizza parlor. That's what we're dealing with here. And that's all like a big laugh and let's slap our knee. But when they start showing up with, uh, you know, guns and when they start to match the profile of what American domestic terror has looked like for quite some time, which, of course, is yeah. uh, for the most part white Americans, many of whom have a military training or members of extreme right wing hate groups. When you start to see that, it is concerning. So what I can say is this. I don't think anybody should blow it out of proportion. We didn't have 200 Humvees coming our way with, with wackos in them. We had one yeah. coming our way. Um, so far, that's what it seems to be. So Are we going to see, are we gonna see further charges? We are charging them as we speak. They're about to have a uh, bail hearing in the relatively near future, the next several hours. They're going to be charged with firearms offenses and uh, also possibly with uh, election, an election crime or two. There's some other minor charges. But it's the kind of case we have to take very seriously. We're going to be asking the court to give a bail that will keep them on ice while we are able to uh, find out more about them and find out whether this really is what we hope it is, which is... Uh, concerning but foolish, uh, as opposed to concerning but frightening. Uh, one thing I wanted to ask you about is, uh, we've only got time for one more question, but very quickly, you are a reform-minded DA. You were elected to do criminal justice reform. Joe Biden could be the next president. He's often associated with the crime bill, well, with mass incarceration, although his platform this time round is much more progressive. Do you have faith that you can work with him on criminal justice reform? You know, in Philly, we figured out that you don't spike the ball before you're in the end zone. I'll be happy to provide any support to anyone who wants to talk about criminal justice reform. But I hope they'll remember that George Gascon right now is winning as a progressive candidate in the biggest criminal justice jurisdiction in the United States. People want reform. Joe wants to work for the people. I'm sure we can figure something out. Hope so, too. District Attorney Larry Krasner, thank you so much for your time. To talk more about the president's lawsuits over voting and what happens when they don't work, 
And to talk more about the president's bizarre approach to pretty much everything, uh, I'm joined by Lincoln Project advisor Michael Steele, former chair of the Republican National Committee, and Bloomberg Opinion senior columnist Tim O'Brien, also author of the book Trump Nation. Uh, gentlemen, thank you both for joining me. Uh, Michael, let me kick off with you. Trump is doing everything he can to pull the plug on even getting a proper result. Uh, Republicans are doing a full court press on the narrative that there is evidence we can't just show it to you. Here's actually one of your successors as RNC chair, the current RNC chair, pushing that line. Have a listen. You said that uh, at the beginning that you would be laying out specific violations. So I, yeah, I, yeah, I do have some specifics. I was told to hold off on, on sharing those, but I do have some specifics. We're gonna we're gonna wait until the attorneys look at it. But the specifics we have in Georgia are very serious. Again, I'm not gonna run and rush to judgment and push push allegations out until we vet them first. <laughs> I do have evidence. I just can't and tell you what it is. That is what the chair of the Republican Party is reduced to now, Michael. I mean, isn't that what the whole press conference thing was, was pushing out allegations? Oh, my gosh. They've got nothing. They've got nothing. The courts have already shown they've got nothing to the extent that they've gotten stuff, stuff in front of the courts. The reality of it is this is being done because Trump wants it to be done. He's the, 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 the puppet master behind the legal machinations that are ongoing. He's the puppet master behind the RNC chairwoman uh, going out there and saying stuff that I, I know Ronna well enough to know she would ordinarily not be going out there saying. Um, but that's her job, and her boss tells her that's what she's got to do. Um, that's why she can't can't share allegations, you know, yet. <laughs> but the reality of it is the numbers are the numbers. This is, a, this is not, you know, a political yeah. problem anymore. It's a math problem. No, you're right. You're right about that. Uh, and I'm not sure how strong Donald Trump's mouth is, to be honest. Uh, Tim, you wrote an article today that says all of Trump's lawsuits are just an attempt to find a scapegoat for his own looming defeat. Quote, his true goal is to find someone or something that he can blame for his own failures and shortcomings uh, in this current case, possibly losing a presidential uh, election. Uh, it seems he can't accept he was defeated fairly, but if he finds a good enough excuse... Will he allow himself to believe he lost at all? Is this, our way, is this his way out, in a way? Oh. I'm sorry. Tim, I think you're on mute, my friend. It's the Zoom, it's the Zoom sorry, moment where you unmute. Unmuted. Go for I it. just unmuted. Um, he is crafting an excuse. He's building a, a rationale that he will use months and, and years hence to say he did not lose the 2020 election. It was a rigged and dirty election, and it was stolen from him. And he's been doing this, by the way, for decades. Donald Trump has been party to over 3,500 lawsuits over the last three decades. One of his old tricks is to sue someone who has an upper hand to then walk away from the mess, settle, and say, this wasn't my fault. I didn't fail. I have no responsibility for this. I always win. And the reality is Donald Trump is going to come out on the other side of this tabulation a loser. He is going to be a one-term president who was impeached and rejected by voters because he was inadequate. But he will probably have a tombstone that says, I won, because that's how he needs to go yeah. off into the sunset. But we shouldn't, I, I think we shouldn't take these lawsuits uh, as anything other than the party's lawyers and the party apparatus giving him one last nod and unfortunately yes. succumbing to his so, own needs. Uh, but it's it's none of this stuff has merit. Tim, you, you mentioned all the lawsuits. Let me just say, you've been the target of a frivolous Trump lawsuit yourself, personally. Indeed. And now you've got the GOP trying to bankroll his legal challenges to the tune, I believe, of $60 million. Um, what was the experience like for you battling Trump's legal nonsense? Well, just one note on the, you know, the GOP bankrolling it, and Eric is on Twitter encouraging people to donate to the Election Defense Fund. Uh, I imagine that could wind up like the Trump Foundation. And anyone who's giving their money to the effort to defend Trump's election prospects in coming days won't see any of that 
but it may help Trump pay down some of his debts. Um, you know, my advice to anyone who gets sued by Donald Trump is he's a bully. I was in a fortunate position. I was at the New York Times. Uh, I had Warner Books was my publisher. So I had institutional support um, legally that made it easy for me to battle back. But having said that, I think he was surprised we battled back. He's a classic bully. He tends to uh, tip over as soon as someone stands up to him. And I think mm -hmm. my little piddly suit matters so little when you compare that to the fact that Donald Trump is now trying to erode public faith in our institutions, yes. a number of them, and right now in the electoral process. And I think it's really important for the party, voters, and everyone else to stand up to the bullying. Mm -hmm. So on that note, let me bring in Michael again. And Michael, let me ask you what I asked McKay Coppins of The Atlantic not long ago. Uh, when do Republicans get tired of putting up with Trump and finally throw him under the bus? Will the GOP continue to let Trump be the face, uh, the be-all and end-all of the Republican Party, even in defeat? They, I don't think they have much choice in that at this point. Uh, look, they, they, they have now a, a new QAnon member in Congress uh, who is all Trump, who's going head head to head with uh, Congressman uh, Crenshaw uh, because he, you know, he's not fighting hard enough for Trump. And his response is, "You're a member of Congress now. Grow up, basically." You know, so that's the battle to come. This is not this is not going to end well inside the GOP. Trump's stain is at this point indelible. Uh, and like every, you know, you know, garment that you have that you, you know, put that Sharpie in your pocket and it sort of leaks through, you're going to have to get rid of that pair of pants. And, and that's probably what the GOP is so, going to have to wind up doing is excising itself in some way of all of this. So given your given that's your kind of prediction, your analysis of where the GOP is, something I've been meaning to ask you and Rick Wilson and others on the Lincoln Project, other Republicans, where do you see your future then? Is it now trying to lobby and work and persuade and pull a Biden administration towards whatever goals you want? Or is it to go back and try and pick up the pieces and fix your old party? Where do you see yourself? Uh, I, I think it's a combination of things. I think one is, is you know, pushing out good government reforms and good government policies. Uh, we, we haven't changed. Our, our philosophical orientation. I'm still a conservative. I'm still a Republican. Uh, I support Joe Biden. And I think Joe Biden is the kind of leader shown that he's shown to be himself to be as a senator who's, uh, you know, making himself available to walk and walk across the aisle and work with, you know, folks like me. So that that gives me hope inside the GOP. Um, that's going to be a different struggle because that that is longstanding. That's 35 years. That's going back to Reagan. Uh, of decay inside the party as the party began to fracture in on itself over what is conservatism and what is republicanism. Um, and now we've got this Trump of Trump factor that changes the entire dynamic yeah. and I think probably pushes both of those uh, to the very edge. And so we'll see what the fight looks like. But one way or the other, you know me, I'm going to be in it, baby. I'm going to be there. <laughs> Well, I'll be honest with you, Michael, a lot of lefties are worried that you're going to be in the fight. They're, they're like, what are all these Republicans doing trying to take over the Democratic Party? So that's why I wanted no. to put that question to you on their behalf. Uh, let, me, let me bring in Tim before we run out of time. Tim, you have written about the president extensively. You know him better than most reporters. I want to ask you this. Take us, one last question to you. Take us inside his head. It's Friday night. Trump's in the White House. Hate watching Fox News. The one network that might, you know, give, him the pre give Biden the presidency before anyone else, ironically. What is he thinking right now? What is going through his head? I, you know, I think he's like a drowning man right now. And, and this has been a unique experience to him because he's learned um, the powers of occupying the bully pulpit and having a Twitter feed that keeps the world on edge. And in short order, people are going to pay radically less attention to his Twitter feed and radically less attention to him post uh Oval Office. I, I do think he's going to remain a force in public life and in the party for some time, but it will never, I think, be what it was right now. And I think he's very aware of that. And for someone who exists, who's essentially a media addict and it needs the public spotlight to be affirmed and to feel that his own life is in order, uh, this is a nightmare for him right now. 
A nightmare for him, probably uh, uh, the happiest of days for a lot of his critics, uh, which I assume includes both of you. Michael Steele and Tim O'Brien, thank you so much for taking time out. I appreciate it. We will talk much more about this historic election uh, when we return. And as we go to break, let's look again at brand new numbers in Maricopa County, Arizona. Uh, a new bunch of ballots, 70,000 ballots came in. Uh, you look at the gap there now, it's 50.4 to 47.7. It's gone down to 53,500 between them in that county. That means statewide with 97% of the vote in, things are getting harder for the president to close the gap as much as he needs to in the time left for him. Arizona, crucial 11 electoral college votes. We will keep an eye on that and our coverage continues in 60 seconds. Don't go away. As we wait for final word on a winner of the 2020 election, and we are waiting, I want to take a moment to take a look at the historic nature of Joe Biden's race and possible uh, victory. Regardless of who wins, he will have uh, broken Obama's record for the most votes ever in a presidential election, which currently stands at roughly 74 million. Pretty amazing that the person with the most votes still can't clearly be declared the winner. Thank you, Electoral College. Look, if Biden does emerge victorious, he'll be the oldest president ever inaugurated at 78 years old and the oldest sitting president, uh, the record for that currently held by Donald Trump uh, and Ronald Reagan. Um, it's a moment Joe Biden has been waiting for over 33 years. He announced his first bid for president in June 1987, a short-lived campaign that ended three months later with allegations of plagiarism, among other things. He ran again in 2008, uh, did very badly in Iowa, instead ended up elected as the vice president to the nation's first black president. And should the third, ta should the third time be the charm for him, he'll have at his side a vice president who's both the first woman uh, and first person of color to hold that office. So we're seeing history in the making here with a lot of firsts, along with it, a lot of reminders that the system is broken in many ways. Uh, joining me now is Kianga Yamata-Taylor, Assistant Professor of American, African American Studies at Princeton, contributing writer at The New Yorker. Thank you so much for coming on. I uh, was really looking forward to this conversation with you because there's so much to discuss. Uh, it's Friday, four days after the election. Joe Biden is leading Trump by about four million votes. And yet we're still waiting on a winner. Does that say to you that American politics and the American democratic system is broken? Yes. <laughs> yes. Thank you for uh, thank you for having me on for these endless nights and, and long days of constantly counting these votes. Um, I think, you know, that this is people keep talking about this uh, campaign as uh, the fight for our democracy. And, you know, I think in many ways that it has demonstrated the ways that American democracy is broken. I mean, if you consider the, uh, the, the considerable efforts to uh, erect obstacles to keep people from voting, to undermine uh, people's access to vote, to counting the votes, Republicans uh, today coming out and suggesting that uh, Pennsylvania just redo the vote because they don't like the outcome. And this isn't just, you know, social media yahoos. These are high-ranking uh, officials up to the president of the United States making these 
uh, these kinds of suggestions. And I think that uh, even with the the resilience of of uh, voters to withstand this, particularly black voters, where uh, these kinds of efforts have largely been directed, that's not a vindication of uh, American democracy. That that is a testament to the defiance, really. Uh, of African Americans. If anything, yes. I think that the the protests uh, that began in the summer, uh, that that people's willingness to withstand this kind of voter harassment uh, is a continuation of yes. those protests. It's not necessarily inspired uh, by the the candidacy of uh, of Joe Biden, but really is an affirmation of uh, African American and and other people's right uh, to to vote in this country. Uh, yes, and very well put. And we're hearing tonight 148 million, I believe, uh, ballots cast uh, in this election, a record turnout. Uh, this is Biden's third run uh, for the presidency, the first way he made it past the primaries. And if you take out all the noise around the election, uh, a Biden win was almost predictable. He was a favorite going in. Uh, yes, he bounced back after Iowa, but he led Trump every single day in the polls from the day he declared his candidacy. Uh, he's now leading. It's not a landslide, but he's got a very big you know, popular vote lead. Um, and I'm just wondering, what does that tell you about the state of the nation um, in terms of, you know, everyone talks about a polarized nation. How does this result play into the polarization? Well, Biden, I mean, Biden looks like he's on the, the, the cusp of winning, but not in ways that uh, he or the Democratic Party imagined, even though he is uh, tallying quite a, a significant um, toll, I think that that demonstrates that this is really a mobilization to get rid of uh, Joe Biden or to get rid of Donald Trump. Because if you look at some of the uh, exit polls, um, I think it's something like 67 percent of Biden voters said they were voting against Trump, not necessarily uh, yes. for Joe Biden, compared to uh, a vast majority of Trump voters who were voting for, um, for Donald Trump. Yes. And so I think that the, the problem that Joe Biden is going to media, immediately run into um, is that it appears that the Republicans will hold on to the Senate. The House of Representatives has lost seven people. And so we are looking at a continuation of the type of gridlock that has effectively crippled uh, the U.S. Congress so that even in the midst of a generational pandemic, even in the midst of the worst economic crisis since the Great Depression, we have a Congress that cannot produce any kind of public assistance to people as millions of people are pushed into poverty. Millions of people are unemployed. Millions yeah. of people have lost their health insurance. Millions of people are hungry. In the most powerful country in the world, we have a government that does not work. And it has been like that since the second term of the Obama administration. So this is. This is a, a, a success for those of us who wanted to see Donald Trump ejected from yes. the office, but it's a failure for those of us who need government to work to actually be able to attend to the uh, so, multiplying crises in our country. So, so on that note, today we saw Biden take the lead in Pennsylvania and Georgia, and I saw a lot of people on social media saying, thank black women for this. Uh, but doesn't the Democratic Party need to do more than just say thank you? How, you know, how about investment uh, in some of those communities of color or even reparations, which is such a radical idea for a lot of people in the Democratic Party? Isn't, shouldn't there be more substance rather than just a thank you message? I mean, there really needs to be more substance. I think that in all of the kind of myopia uh, with getting the vote out, we often then uh, lose in the discussion who the candidates are, what the political issues are uh, that involved, and really what's at, at stake. So now we're looking at yet another situation where black voters are thanked for saving the nation, uh, but where there is really no commitment uh, to understand the responsibility of that. The Democratic Party wants all of the votes of, of black Americans without any of the obligation or responsibility uh, to actually create policies that can deal with the disproportionate ways that inequality affects Black people um, in this country. And yeah. to me, it represents uh, a, almost a third crisis in uh, the, the U.S. democracy, which is 
the the stranglehold that the two party system has on being able uh, to develop different voices, different choices, uh, uh, a different kind of politics. Because really, people, African Americans, other people who are core constituency of the Democratic Party base are voting out of fear of Trump, not as an affirmation of Joe Biden, not as, as enthusiastic so supporters of his politics. So on, the, on that note, because we're almost out of time, but I do want to ask you this question. You supported sure. Bernie Sanders uh, during the primaries, yeah. not Joe Biden. Uh, we're hearing a lot of pushback against the Sanders wing, the progressive wing, not just from Republicans during the election, but since Election Day, we have moderate Democrats, centrist Democrats saying, oh, stop talking about socialism. It's costing us races. We went too far to the left. Do you worry that Joe Biden is going to hear those voices? Or do you think actually the left can actually get stuff out of Biden, can successfully push Biden to the left? The left has to push has to push Biden. I think that this is part of an ongoing conflict uh, within the Democratic Party. Who will lead the party? And you know, before the votes have even been counted, the conflict has come uh, to the surface. But for the centrists, uh, this is an insane. The mobilization of activists throughout the summer and into the fall are the reason why Joe Biden is sitting in the position. Uh, that that he is. And as long as the Congress is going to be tied up in gridlock, you can be assured that the social movements, the activists, the people who have yeah. delivered this election uh, aren't going anywhere and are going to continue to press on these demands. Yeah. We're out of time, but thank you so much. That was a fascinating conversation. Appreciate it. Kianga Yamata-Taylor, thank you so much for your time. When we come back, crowds grow outside of the Phoenix Center where they're tabulating votes. We'll talk about threats to the people simply trying to count ballots and by extension, the violent threat to democracy itself when we come back. The past four years have, of course, been far from a normal presidency, and the past four days have been far from a normal election. Just as Donald Trump's presidency was marked by authoritarianism and bullying and threats of violence, so too was his attempt to win re-election this week. In Detroit, Michigan, swarms of pro-Trump protesters chanting stop the count attempted to push their way into a center where poll workers were counting up 170,000 ballots. In Phoenix, a group of armed Trump supporters are back outside the Maricopa County Elections Office, some chanting count the vote as officials tried to do just that under police protection. Listen to the Clark County Registrar in Nevada speaking to reporters on Thursday. I can tell you that my wife and my mother are very concerned for me, but we have security here. Uh, we have law enforcement who are protecting us. I am concerned for the safety of my staff. 
This is supposed to be America in 2020, not the Balkan circa 1992. That's not supposed to happen here. Bipartisan election officials fearing for their lives, surrounded by mobs with guns. But what do you expect when you have some top Republicans openly, brazenly, shamelessly inciting violence, ratcheting up the hate, the abuse, the threats? On Thursday, Steve Bannon, former Trump White House chief strategist, was suspended from Twitter, but not Facebook, for calling for the beheading, yes, the beheading of Dr. Anthony Fauci and Christopher Wray, the director of the FBI. I kid you not. I'd actually like to go back to the old uh, times of Tudor England. I'd put the heads on pikes, right? I'd put them at the two corners of the White House as a warning to federal bureaucrats. You either get with the program or you're gone. Time to stop playing games. Blow it all out. But imagine if a Muslim called for the killing of the FBI chief. Just imagine. Then there's the president's son, Don Jr. Here he is on Twitter on Thursday calling for, quote, total war over the election. And here he is standing next to Republican state representative in Georgia, Vernon Jones, last night when Jones said this. This fight is just getting started. Yes. We're starting now to see the white of their eyes and we get ready to start shooting. Start shooting. That's what he said. Well, we may have avoided a possible shooting situation in Philadelphia yesterday. Two men were arrested in the city last night, not far from the convention center where votes were being tallied with pistols, an AR-15 style rifle and 160 rounds of ammunition. Oh, and with a bunch of QAnon stickers on their Hummer as well. Luckily, as you heard earlier from Philly DA Larry Krasner just a few minutes ago on this show, there's no evidence of any ties to extremist groups or a formal terror plot. They were charged with illegal weapons position and they got a parking ticket too. Fortunately, Election Day itself came and went without any acts of mass violence or domestic terrorism or widespread voter intimidation. But look, if you think the violence and thuggishness of the Trump years ends with the departure of Donald Trump from the White House, then you haven't been paying attention. Gun sales in America surged this year. Hate groups were emboldened and empowered by this president. Far-right extremists tried to kidnap and murder a Democratic governor. Republicans in Congress now include supporters of QAnon, which the FBI calls a potential domestic terror threat. So I have some bad news for you. This is not over. You can't just put this genie of far-right violence and extremism back in the bottle, especially when one of the two main political parties in this country is feeding it. Joining me now is Christian Picciolini, founder of the Free Radicals Project. Uh, in a former life, he was a member of a neo-Nazi group. Today, he works to de-radicalize uh, such individuals and groups. Uh, Christian, welcome to the show. As I said a moment ago, I think it's hard to put the genie of extremism, domestic extremism, back in the bottle. Is that fair to say, or am I overstating the case? Well, I don't know that the genie was ever in the bottle. I think this is something we've been dealing with for, <laughs> you know, a couple hundred years. And it's, not, it's not something that we've ever called by its proper name, nor have we, you know, really faced. And it's certainly not something that, you know, started or ended with Donald Trump. Uh, I think what we're seeing now, frankly, is just the beginning of what we will see in the future, because they've now seen a taste of what it feels like to have, uh, you know, the, the most power that they've ever experienced, uh, you know, frankly, in our life. Lifetimes. And they are going to come back four years from now, eight years from now, uglier and stronger, I think, than they've ever been. So I think you're absolutely right, Mehdi, in saying this is not the end. This is, there is no way to put the genie in the bottle. What we need to do is figure out how to eliminate the genie. We need to figure out how to eliminate this cancer of extremism that is now rampant in our society. No, exactly right. And that's a, a depressing scenario that you paint, but a very realistic one. Uh, we have not seen the sorts of mass violence or civil strife that many of us worried about in the lead up to the election. But there is a lot of misinformation and extremism out there being inflamed by the president. Uh, what I wonder is, with the president gone from the scene, will that make it easier to tackle groups like the Proud Boys, who he gives kind of marching orders to in a live presidential debate, or will that make it harder because they see as some sort of their hero, their leader being robbed? 
Well, no, I think that having a new administration will pave the way for, you know, fixing some of these problems, as long as the next administration is fully committed to focusing on those problems. We have yet had an administration that, that you know, fully called out white supremacy as a terror threat. We have yet to have an administration that has said, we are going to focus on the survivors and those who are marginalized by these groups, and we are going to listen to them and empower them. We have yet to have an administration that is going to uh, take this on as a challenge and instead of walking away from it just because they've won, is going to take it on as their number one priority to make sure that equity is available to everybody in this country. So, I, you know, I really think we have a lot of hard work in front of us. Uh, and to think that this election is going to be the end of it, um, no, I'm sorry, but that it's just yeah. the beginning of what we need to do. So, Christian, you and I have talked before about the role that Trump has played in stoking uh, far-right groups. Um, even if Trump's gone... The Republican Party itself is kind of white nationalist adjacent in many ways. It has extremists in its elected ranks. It now has a QAnon congresswoman, Marjorie Taylor Greene. And we've seen some pretty incendiary rhetoric come out of other Republican politicians, too. Is this just the party of extremism now, the party that feeds uh, domestic extremism now? Well, you know, I think for four years, Donald Trump has shown us exactly who he is. You know, he's shown us to be a misogynist. He's shown us to be a racist and a bigot and a xenophobe. And four years later, we don't have 62 million people voting for him. Now we have 70 million people voting for him. Uh, now, granted, there's hope. Uh, and Joe Biden has received, you know, over 4 million more votes than Donald Trump. Yeah. But the fact remains, is we still have 70 million people after seeing four years of, uh, of what Donald Trump yeah. has done and how he's marginalized people are still willing to put that aside and vote for him. So we have a problem. We have a very significant problem. But and I, I'm not saying that... that I, I completely agree with you on the numbers. I, I, I agree with you on the numbers, but I'm just asking about the GOP itself, because... Even if we say Donald Trump leaves, he loses, he goes quietly, we never hear from him again, which is all very unlikely. Do you still have a Republican Party where senators, members of Congress uh, at the state house level, governors are saying and doing incendiary things which acts as fuel for some of these far right movements? Oh, yeah, absolutely. I think the Republican Party has a big problem to deal with. Not only are they white nationalist adjacent, but they are QAnon adjacent. They're militia adjacent. adjacent. And these are militias that are not pro-American. They are looking to destroy the democracy that we've built America on. So they've got a lot of cleaning up to do. But I also want to be very clear that Democrats going forward must be laser focused, must be laser focused on progress. Uh, otherwise, you know, if we just become complacent and we go back to normal, frankly, what normal Normal has been has not been good enough for most Americans. So we need to do we need to find a way to do better. But the Republicans have an absolute problem. They've got uh, a whole house that is uh, you know that is full of apologizers, sympathizers for Donald Trump, but also you know even people who are further on the extreme like QAnon, like Marjorie Taylor Greene, and, and places like Georgia. And uh, you know I think as a country we're going to have to deal with this together, and it's not just a party that's going to have to deal with it. Christian Picciolini, I wish we didn't have to keep having these conversations. And every time we do, it seems to be more depressing and things seem to be getting worse. But thank you so much for your time. We always appreciate your insights. We are finally at the end of a crazy week, but not at the end of this election saga. Uh, Wajad Ali and Brittany Patna Cunningham will be back to join me and talk about where we go from here. And as we go to break, last night, Joe Biden trailed Donald Trump in Pennsylvania. Not anymore, just now. He has grown his lead to 27,130 votes with 96% of the vote in. That's because of a slew of new absentee ballots in from Allegheny County. The return board is still processing military and overseas ballots. Kind of people Donald Trump doesn't want to vote, apparently. Back with more on the election after this short break. Don't go away. You're watching Peacock.
Remember Tuesday? I know it feels like five years ago. But try to think back. That's when it looked like President Trump was on the verge of keeping the White House as one of his many residences. It also looked like Mitch McConnell would keep his job as Senate Majority Leader. But that's why you keep on counting the votes. Right now, the Senate is still split 48 to 48. And depending on how things play out, it could all come down to Georgia, where not one but two Senate seats are up for grabs, and both could go to a runoff. Back with me again tonight, a contributing op-ed writer to The New York Times, Wajahat Ali, and Brittany Packnett Cunningham, host of the podcast, uh, Undistracted. Guys, good to have you back. Um, Wajahat, let me start with you. And Brittany, I'm going to ask you both the same question. Uh, you can answer it in turn. How crazy has this week been in terms of all the political weeks you've ever covered as journalists, activists, human beings? Watch first. Uh, I'm a son of South Asian immigrants, and I'm never allowed to do this. So for once, let me flex. I was on your show twice talking to you and Zerlina. And Tuesday night, what did I say, Mehdi? I said, have faith, be optimistic. They're going to flip five states. I said it. I said, they're going to take Georgia. I said, just have faith on the runoff. This is not as crazy as 2000. I'm an old uncle now, I just turned 40. 2000 was the dagger in my heart, which is why I had tough, thick skin. All of this, all you guys complaining, you young bucks, you guys weren't around in 2000. That's when we had to wait and Bush won by 537 votes in Florida and the Supreme Court gave it to him 5-4. That's why I'm telling Democrats to flex. You have won by most likely 7 million votes. And by the way, when it comes to Georgia, can I just say this? This is what Pelosi, Schumer, Biden have to do. They get Stacey Abrams on Zoom and they say this, Stacey, what should we do? Tell us exactly what, we, what to do and we're gonna do it right now. And you can win these seats because my brother, Raphael, good man, he can win. And Ossoff, he was fire on that last debate, which is probably what gave him the runoff. These are two weak Republican candidates, corrupt, tied to Trump. We can take this. Yeah. Brittany, yeah, how's this I... week been to you compared to previous weeks? I mean, I was 16, but I did live through 2000. I was deeply interested. I actually think I remember Al Gore calling into Thank, our big Thanks for rubbing it in. Thing. Thanks for rubbing <laughs> it in that Waj is 40 and I'm 41 and you're not. Thanks for rubbing That's that in, Brittany. Appreciate that on a That's Friday night. That's the only night. reason she did it. Just to mess with you guys a little bit, but I did go down memory lane about 2000 last night on Twitter to educate folks even younger than all of us who had no idea what we were talking about and did not understand why I was so vigorously dead set against things like the Electoral College. 2000 was the year that cemented it for me. Um, and so I do remember living through that. I remember the painstaking saga that that was. And I remember that that was a successful theft of an election. I do not believe that there will be another successful theft this time. And that is one of the things that is giving me a lot of hope. I'm with Waj. I woke up on election day feeling a lot of what I call disciplined hope. Hope that is informed by data, hope that is steeped in reality, but hope that still believes in the power of the people. And that is what we saw at work. Also to echo Waj, I think it's incredibly important that Democrats actually take this win as a mandate. Look, if we don't spike the ball, we will make way and make it much easier for in four years or eight years, a much kinder, gentler dictator to come along and have Donald Trump mindsets, but actually have a prime time ready presentation. If Democrats do not vigorously and urgently separate ourselves from the kind of politicking, yeah. the kind of behavior and the kind of policies that the GOP continues to push forward, then we will allow space for somebody like that to come in. And I want to make sure that I'm a part of a party or at least associated with people who are ready to do the hard work when it matters. Brittany, as Senator Harris gets closer and closer to the White House, what does hearing Vice President-elect Kamala Harris mean to you and to Waj? I'll come to Waj later. Brittany, to you first. I mean, it's just, I'm honestly still making sense of it. I think, you know, I remember never thinking that I would see a black president in my lifetime and then sitting there on that fateful night and watching uh, uh, President Obama cross 270. Uh, and now to see uh, a black and South Asian woman actually uh, be right in line to enter that White House that our ancestors built um, is an incredibly powerful moment. And I think we have to recognize this is about more than just representation. Representation certainly matters. Um, watching that video of Kamala Harris tell her, uh, her, her great niece uh, that she too can be president 
president is such a powerful moment, and that's why representation matters. But we have to remember that Kamala Harris had one of the most progressive uh, records while she was in the Senate. And I'm looking forward to making sure that somebody who has been very intentional about her own evolution and who will bring perspective that Joe Biden doesn't have will be in the meetings and having the conversation where it counts. So I'm excited about the way that she's making history, yeah. walking through those doors, but I'm even more excited for the policy that will get done um, as we continue to push this White House. I'm so glad you mentioned policies because, watch, uh, Kamala Harris did have a very progressive voting record in the Senate. Some would argue she didn't have that progressive a record as a prosecutor in California. And John Legend, who was on the show Monday night on the eve of the election, he's actually campaigning with Kamala Harris. And he said to me on this show, he said, look, representation matters, diversity matters, but policy matters too, and we have to hold them to account. So I wonder, A, what does that mean to you, Kamala Harris, half South Asian as vice president-elect possibly in the coming days, but also holding to account is important as well. You can do both. Look, first and foremost, rep representation, uh, quality representation matters. First female vice president, first black and South Asian vice president, daughter of a Jamaican and Indian immigrant is going to be the vice president to Joe Biden. And look, we're do we don't play identity politics, right? Because you don't see me and you maybe sitting here saying, Ajit Pai, he's our guy. You know, we don't sit there and say, Bombi Jindal, Nikki Haley, you're not seeing uh, Brittany saying, oh, Candace Owens, it's lovely that she has such a platform. No, it's because she's a quality progressive who has the bona fides. Now, when it comes to reform, we have every right to hold them accountable, just like we hold Joe Biden accountable for that disastrous vote, the crime bill, right? But people evolve, people change, and Joe Biden and Kamala are gonna come around. And this is what politicians tell all the people sitting at home. Let me tell you how politics works. They always tell you on the deal, you got to make me do it. You got to make me do the right thing that I know what I have to do because they have elections to win. They got fundraisers, right? So we have to organize. We have to push. The work is ongoing. And you keep pushing towards progress. And Kamala and Biden, by the way, have the ears of people on the ground who know what needs to be done. We have to do the work to push, to message, and to make this a more just and equitable society. And Kamala is the person who can help get that done. She gets it. She gets it. They will evolve. They will reform. We have to push them gently, critique them when we have to, because the work is just getting started, ladies and gentlemen. This is a long-term uh, goal that we have to get to. And the last thing I'll say, you had Krishna on talking about white nationalists. We're dealing with the death march of white supremacy all around the world. They're playing for all the marbles. So you, if you think the work is over, nope, spike the ball, drink whatever you got to drink. I'm going to take a chai shot. Next day, work, 2022, 2024. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. We absolutely on that note, I'm going to have to let you both go. We're out of time on this Friday evening. Appreciate you both. Wajahad Ali, Brittany Packnett, coming in. We're going to have to leave it there. Appreciate your time. I hope to have you back on soon. Thanks to you all for watching. That does it for us tonight on Peacock. We will see you back here Monday, perhaps with a projected presidential winner. Maybe. Good night. <laughs>